next, 4281 on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Freedom delayed. Four more weeks. That's the delay expected to be added to the lifting of all lockdown restrictions in the UK. It had been due to happen on June 21st, but UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson to address the nation later today and to push that date into July. It's all down to a surge in the Delta variant, and government ministers thought to want more people to have their second COVID vaccine before they ease all restrictions. How are markets responding? Well, they're largely taking it in their stride. The FTSE 100 actually gaining ground. Strategists saying that that delay largely priced in, that we could see further weakness for travel and leisure and hospitality stocks. The pound falling against the dollar, though Nomura say this weakness likely to be temporary. In fact, money markets largely bullish on sterling, given the pace at which economic gloom has been lifting here in the UK. Indeed, last week's GDP figures pointed to an economy that is recovering quickly, and later this week we'll get unemployment, inflation and retail sales data that should all further illuminate the economic recovery. kitchen sink at the banks with the stress test. The banks passed with flying colors. Monday at 4.30 p.m., we expect a flurry of press releases that announces increases in dividends and buybacks, and we ultimately expect capital return to double versus the prior year. Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo expecting the banks to return cash to shareholders with Fed curbs in the rearview mirror. That happened to boost financials to their best week since February. For more, let's bring in Taylor Riggs. Taylor, 430 just around the corner. It is. And like you've been saying, about $140 billion for some of at least the top six banks that we could get a flurry of some of those announcements, and particularly uh, led by J.P. Morgan and B of A could be the largest, as you see there, in terms of really announcing capital return plans. Could come in the form of both buybacks, of course, which would be the most, and then, of course, some dividend raises. So that's really going to be a key focus. And it's interesting because if you take a look at the chart in the terminal, the dividend advantage has been slowly eroding. Of course, we know that financials are still the second best performer of this year, so that relative dividend attractiveness has been falling. Does that change after the bell today? We will see. One thing we know, though, is that the price performance, at least today, may be a little bit lower. As you can see there, we're off about 1% to 2%. 
But do not forget, we're coming off of five straight days of gains all last week, of course, after that Fed stress test announcement. And rebounding after what has been a really, really tough June, you're still off about 3% for the month and the second worst performer, John. And that snapback, that correction took place last week. So tell it just quickly, from people you're speaking to at the moment, was that the move off the back of what we're talking about now, capital return plans, or was that move driven by what happened in the bond market? You know, a, a little bit of both. Some has been that underperformance and, of course, that trade back into slick, cyclical goals that you have been talking about, how much of that trade maybe was overdone and that some of that momentum coming back. And of course, I think we know today a lot of that price action around the buyback and that capital return plan, it is now maybe priced in. Taylor, thank you. Taylor Riggs, Caroline Hyde, Romain Bostick, coming up a little bit later on a close on Bloomberg TV. Let's cross over now to Nuveen's Brian Nick and Stuart Kaiser of UBS. After the close, we'll get those announcements, Brian. Some big payouts expected from the big banks on Wall Street. Brian, do you want to stick with the banks? I've got the bank sector right now on the S&P 500 up 27% year to date. That's through the first half. What will the second half bring? So I'm more confident that interest rates are going to be higher by the end of the year than I am that the oil price is going to be higher. So if I'm choosing between financials and energy uh, to play the cyclical trade, I'd still rather be with the banks. The, the, the trouble is, and we have a whole uh, section devoted to this in the mid-year, is the, the 10-year has really become this puzzle. I think it's been accentuated after the FOMC meeting. We basically have it you know, moving down because the expectations are now that the Fed tightens too quickly, too early. They won't have to tighten by as much, so rates stay lower. Um, it's going to be hard for, I think, for investors to continue to puzzle this out. We still are pretty confident that by the end of this year, we're going to be higher on the 10-year. The, ec the economy will still be doing well, be probably as well as expected, not better than expected at this point. But that will still mean that we can see rates kind of rolling forward to that eventual liftoff and pushing up. And that should be fine for the banks, especially in this, this I think, overall very strong global growth environment. But Brian, from your standpoint, the capital return plans alone don't get it done. You need the bond market to come with you. It's been so correlated to the 10-year, the relative performance. It's hard to escape from that trade, really, in any sector. I mean, we have the, you know, the, the, the very high dividend sectors have been kind of negatively leveraged uh, to, to the 10-year in many ways. Financials are going to be positively leveraged. And one thing we, we caution investors about is if we do get some kind of taper-related tantrum, some kind of Fed policy error that's worse than the one that we had uh, two weeks ago, um, there's not that many things that do well in a portfolio in that environment. Ten, you could have your bond portfolio selling off, credit should do fine, but in the equity market, the financials would probably be the best game in town in that kind of uh, environment. So if you're looking to hedge against that particular kind of risk, this is not a bad way to do it. So Stu, from your perspective, are we all bond market strategists now? <laughs> I think we've all been bond market strategists for six or 12 months, John. I think we just, uh, <laughs> just didn't know it, unfortunately. Um, and I, I'm equally bad at that as I am at volatility, so it really hasn't changed my, my, <laughs> my, my career trajectory at all. Um, but look, we are, you know, our view both technically and from a fundamental pers perspective is you're going to get higher yields in the U.S. As I mentioned, the mix shift is different. And for that reason, it actually makes us more buyers of banks than we otherwise would have been. Um, you know, I think coming into the FOMC, we like, you know, metals and mining. We liked energy. Banks was in the mix, probably more of a second half trade. Uh, what the FOMC did is it kind of pulled that forward. And, and we like being along those financials, uh, especially in earnings. Yeah, Brian called it a puzzle. Stuart, why is it less of a puzzle for you? You seem to have some confidence around this theme that we get high yields, higher real yields specifically. Nominal yields were 135 this time last week on Monday. Then by the end of the week, they touched 130, 153, 154 intraday. I couldn't get my head around some of the price actions, Stuart. Friday morning, I was sitting there wondering why yields weren't higher off the back of supposedly a deal down in DC, and then they crept higher in the afternoon. Stuart, what gives you a little bit more confidence on the outlook? Blind optimism, uh, of course, Jonathan, blind optimism. Uh, look, uh, you know, our view is is that a lot of the move you had lower was was getting some shorts covered in the rates market. And from here, you'd actually need real money buyers of 10-year yields. And we just don't necessarily think that flow is there. So our rate strategists do expect kind of a move higher in rates. And the second is I think we become more and more convinced about the trajectory of both U.S. and global economic growth. And as that growth continues to accelerate, we think that's going to that's gonna push yields higher as well. So I think there's a little supply-demand dynamic at play, and there's also just, frankly, our view on what growth is as well um, is, is feeding into that view. Yeah, Brian, just to build on that, final question to you, sir. The positioning clean-out, clear-out that we've had over the last several weeks, particularly going into last week, do you think that's sufficient to be a little bit more comfortable with the outlook for high yields? Yeah, we do. I, I think this is another story that's very leveraged to the, the overall economy. We're going to see, I think, very low default rates. 
the demand for yield is not going anywhere. Even if the 10 year backs up a little bit, that could actually create a sort of a short term spurt into high yield. One thing about the post FOMC environment was, I think, quite striking was it was very quiet in the credit markets. It wasn't this sort of taper tantrum environment like we saw in 2013 where credit spreads blew out. We've seen that happen a couple of other times too uh, since then. Last week and, and the week before, we were quite quiet for, for credit. Now we see spreads pushing even lower. We think they can go lower still, but most of that high yield trade in the second half of the year is going to be carry. High yield spreads, the tightest since 2007 already. We keep coming back to that theme. Brian Nick, it's good to hear from you, particularly to get your mid-year outlook on this program. Stuart Kaiser, UBS, joining us too on this program. Let's get you some sector price action now. Equities near all-time highs. With a sector price action, here's our stocks editor, Dave Wilson. Thanks, John. Yeah, a bit of a standoff going on in the S&P 500. You know, on the one hand, you have technology stocks moving higher along with utilities. A lot of the tech strength tied into NVIDIA, which, according to the Sunday Times over in the UK, got some endorsements for its proposed $40 billion takeover of the chip designer arm. So, you know, that's a plus. On the other hand, the more economically sensitive areas of the market, energy, finance, industrials, materials, all lower in early trading. Healthcare kind of hanging around, but one area of strength within that group is biotech. I mean, you're seeing Regeneron Pharmaceuticals move higher, and it's working with a company called Intellia Therapeutics on a treatment for liver disease that involves CRISPR gene editing technology. This uh, won the Nobel Prize last year, uh, and so they're taking that technology and putting it to use. And so you've seen Intellia move up more than 47% in early trading, Beam Therapeutics, uh, CRISPR Therapeutics, Editas Medicine, companies like that also moving higher and giving the NASDAQ Biotech Index a lift, which it needs because it's been trailing the S&P 500 this year and also the uh, NASDAQ uh, Composite. NASDAQ, record highs this morning. Hey, Dave, great to catch up. The S&P, record highs too. Coming up on the program, the market moving events you need to be watching. That'll be next in our trading diary as we count you down to payrolls Friday from New York. We're down around about three points on the S&P. We pull back 0.06%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. into perspective. We're going to try to fold an economic theory here uh, with what we've got based on data. The focus is going to be on the data, the manufacturing data. How the market responds will be really interesting. Timely conversations. Part of getting out of uh, this hole is big fiscal. Keeping you up to date on trends. When do you take this thing off? So you put it on to take it back off. Wake up with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. From New York City, about 25 minutes into the session this morning, good morning. Our performance on the NASDAQ 100, all-time highs. Big tech, top of the pile. The S&P 500 pulling back just a little bit 
by 0.01%. Let's call it a record high on the S&P. Big churn beneath the surface. We'll talk about that through the day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. What you need to be watching through the week ahead. The president stopping in Wisconsin later today to promote his infrastructure plan. The biggest U.S. banks preparing to disclose their capital distribution plans after the closing bell. Plus the Fed speak continuing. Quells and Barkin later on in the day. We get U.S. and Eurozone consumer confidence on Tuesday and finally rounding out the week with the big one, the payrolls report in the United States. From New York City this morning, good morning. 700K is the median estimate, the moving target going into Friday. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Months after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico is still in peril. Huge swaths of the island are still without power, running water, or access to medical care. Experts estimate that it will take years before these services are restored island-wide. Much of the blame has been placed on FEMA for a slow response in comparison to recent disasters on the mainland. But recovery from a disaster of this complexity and scale has proven more challenging than anyone anticipated. And filling the gaps between an overextended public sector and a suffering populace falls on the private citizens. Robert Anderson is a Puerto Rico resident of four years. The eye of the storm came in south of El Yunque, swept up towards San Juan and out to Arecibo. 
Everything on the right-hand side is what we call the dirty side of the storm. This isn't his first time in a disaster zone. With a military and telecom background, Anderson worked on repairing damaged cell phone towers in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Some might be tempted to label him a disaster capitalist, seeking lucrative government contracts for his expertise. But as Anderson finds himself in the middle of a humanitarian crisis, he and his associates are developing a variety of pro bono recovery projects that target the island's hardest hit areas. I see two Puerto Ricos. We're here in San Juan. They have telecommunications restored. It may or may not have power, but basic services are in place. They're able to get food. They're able to buy things. They're surviving. And when you look outside of the San Juan area, you can go 15 minutes from here and find areas that are devastated. I'm working on the devastated side. Today, he's put together a boots on the ground mission to provide medical care to some of the island's most isolated and vulnerable residents. Steve Berenbaum is one of Anderson's business associates. He offered an extra car and a set of hands. So we received an initial report from a nurse that was out in the area. We're headed to the northeast region of Utuado for some people that are in need of urgent medical assistance. Dr. Sally Priester is a physician from San Juan. She filled a van with medical supplies at her own expense and brought along a team of nurses. Google Maps estimated our first destination to be a 90-minute drive. But it didn't account for obstacles like this. Our first stop was the home of an 82-year-old blind Vietnam veteran. His roof was blown off by the storm, and he's been living alone in a back shed for nearly two months. His cane actually got broken in the storm, um, so he's limited mobility. He has a number of medical ailments. Dr. Priester's having a look at him. We called the VA. They're going to get him set up with what he needs, get him stabilized so he can then be transported either to an evacuation center or off the island. It's when the chain gets broken, when those, when those families that are connected to them leave the island or take off. These guys get left at the end of the road, and um, it's tough. FEMA was not officially part of Robert's team, and their arrival caught everyone by surprise. Their job here was to survey and report back to their superiors and did not come with medical aid of any kind. People think that FEMA is there to hand out bottles of water. It's not what they do. FEMA has a role to play. They have a very specific role. They bring in ships, they bring in airplanes, they bring in tractor trailers with pallets of things. But they're a big machine, um, and there's gaps in that thing. And you're seeing one of the gaps here, and we help fill that role. These guys are in a bad situation before, and now they're struggling for real basic things. One of the risks that you run is people going from fear to hopelessness. Uh, those are the folks that we're trying to reach. And how are they reached? How are they even found? Word of mouth, mostly. And what's your role in all this? Um, ghost in the machine. I'm lucky enough to be able to communicate with folks in FEMA, the uh, state of Puerto Rico. For a ghost, Robert makes his presence well known. Not only was he the de facto leader of the mission, now with FEMA in tow, he created his own maps to survey storm damage. So we're uh, right here. And delivered them to FEMA HQ free of charge. I have pretty good reach. Perhaps that's how he managed to earn himself a coveted FEMA badge without actually working for them. And it's these relationships that allow him to operate more efficiently than an NGO or a government agency. We're able to resolve problems at a different level. Our next stop was on a mountaintop, a family of 11 struggling to care for their special needs brother in what was left of their house. Probably we are the first uh, health team uh, to come and visit this family. Muy bien, todo muy bien. The patient has a uh, Down syndrome. He is all day in bed. The difficulty with this is the patient cannot be alone. The most important thing is that you need to take care of the chronic disease besides his ability because they have been not going to a doctor. And no doctor has come in here yet. So we need a refill of this medication. After maybe 54 days, it's not getting better. And the only way that you can be able to see that is coming to the ground, drive, and see the people and talk to the people. You can see San Juan from here, but you can't get there. It's like the Emerald City. On 
this stop, we caught word that a man living alone at the edge of the jungle was in need of care. So we decided to take a little detour, come up here and check out and see what's going on. One of the challenges is to find those people that are at the end of these roads that need help. I'm asking about uh, why he's alone right here. He said things of life happens. Yeah. I'm here by my side. Esto, so donde vive acá? En la parte. This is not a job. To do this, you need to have passion for what you can do. You're not going to get paid. It said in disaster response and emergency response that the real first responders are your neighbors. You don't need to wait for a lucrative FEMA contract to go out and, and do good and to help the community. In the end, do you feel like you're making a difference? The lives you touch and people that you can affect, I don't really think about it in those terms. But why do you do it? It helps me sleep at night. Um, I think it's as much for the people that are going out to help and do things that it is for the people that you affect. Whether out of altruism, or the lure of a paid gig, or some mixture of the two, Anderson hopes to stay here to help shape Puerto Rico's future. Puerto Rico's essentially been a colony for 400 years. It was treated poorly by the Spanish. It was not treated well by the United States when they first got here. Puerto Rico can continue in the way that it's always been, or Puerto Rico can rebuild itself like nothing that's ever been. And we have to do everything we can to make that real. That's the bottom line.
when I met him first online, I found him to be really sweet. I think I was the one who was talking for an hour. He was just listening. When we met, I I saw her. She was uh, beautiful, intelligent, and kind, which was, I mean, something that I was I was looking for. <laughs> Anshu and Sumit are one of about 12 million couples that get married in India every year. Unlike their parents' generation, they're not from two close villages, but from two cities on opposite sides of the country. And their love didn't start through community matchmaking, marriage brokers, or classified ads in newspapers, but began online. So we met through jeevansati.com. So it's basically an online portal where we have detailed profile of different grooms and brides. It makes a lot of remote profiles which were located in distant areas more accessible. Thanks to growing internet and smartphone usage, matrimony websites and apps in India are starting to disrupt the matchmaking industry. More and more people are finding their partners at the click of a mouse. Jivanseti.com, where Anshu and Sumit met, is one of the biggest players. Young Indians looking for love set up profiles including their caste and horoscope, but their criteria for choosing spouses appears to be changing. We have seen the shift from, you know, uh, traditional caste community uh, conservative parameters to something like which is more focused on education, employment. Anshu and Sumit's marriage was initiated by their parents, but modern Indian couples like them have more input than previous generations. We looked up to them to agree for the proposal, but it was primarily our decision that we wanted to be with each other. So what's the emoji like you use the most? <laughs> <laughs> to each other? <laughs> There's a bear which basically we use for indicating a hug. Yeah, that, that's our language basically, bear I can follow. Time flies when you're in love, and just one and a half months after they first met online, the couple got engaged. They decided to hold their wedding less than three months later. But planning a traditional Hindu wedding on such short notice is no easy task. The massive event usually lasts three days, has various ceremonies and celebrations, and involves the entire two families and hundreds of guests. Luckily, there are websites and apps for that. We searched online, we got in touch with Wedding Brigade and they helped us finalize the venue. And it makes the search faster and efficient. Startups like the Wedding Brigade are challenging traditional wedding planners in this $50 billion industry. It provides various services from booking banquet venues to buying wedding gowns. The website makes money by charging commission from vendors. People don't want to be limited to what is available around them. They want to know the entire range of options available before making a decision. And now it's easy to find almost everything on one portal. Anshu and Sumit are officially married in a ritual that has gone on for thousands of years. But their love started in a very new way. Technologies might be changing the way couples meet, date, and get married in India, but they're definitely not changing everything. The technology was only the first level help that we could get to find each other. Everything else was like very humanly and emotions and feelings. Right?
Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren has become a symbol of everything the Republican Party stands against. Everyone gets a right to basic health care. We need strong oversight of these banks. A legal scholar and a consumer advocate turned politician, Warren has branded herself as a champion of the working class and made a career out of standing up to big business. While rumors of a 2020 presidency bid remain just that. I'm not running for president. Her Senate seat is up for re-election in 2018, and Republicans are already pumping millions into super PACs to defeat her. This is the story of how a law professor and politician came to be seen as the biggest threat to Republican values and the greatest hope for progressive America. Elizabeth Warren was born Elizabeth Ann Heron, the youngest of three siblings on June 22, 1949 in Oklahoma City to middle-class parents. After waiting tables to help her family pay the bills, Warren became a star on the high school debate team. She landed a scholarship to George Washington University at the age of 16, but two years later dropped out to marry her high school sweetheart, Jim Warren. By 1980, Warren was a mother of two, divorced and remarried, had earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Houston, a jurist degree from Rutgers, and practicing law in New Jersey. Warren then went on to become an influential law professor, teaching, lecturing, and publishing highly cited work on bankruptcy and commercial law at seven universities around the country, eventually settling at Harvard Law School. But Warren wasn't always a liberal lion. Elizabeth Warren used to be a Republican, actually. That's Stephen Dennis. I'm a Senate reporter for Bloomberg. Around the time that Elizabeth Warren switched parties, she became a fierce opponent of a Republican drive to make it much harder to file for bankruptcy. She fought that for a decade. It ended up passing anyways. While her efforts ultimately failed, her warning calls were heard in 2008. We're in the midst of a serious financial crisis. Our entire economy is in danger. And without immediate action by Congress, America could slip into a financial panic and a distressing scenario would unfold. Professor Warren was tapped to help with oversight in the government bailout. She would excoriate bankers and their bonuses and their practices. Why should the U.S. taxpayer alone carry city? She proposed a series of tough regulations, which became the basis for much of the Dodd-Frank financial law that we have today. That sort of catapulted her to national stardom, particularly among the progressive left. Encouraged by her newfound notoriety, Warren declared her bid for the U.S. Senate on September 14, 2011. During the race, her opponent Scott Brown tried to derail Warren by accusing her of falsely claiming Native American heritage, a controversy that earned her the nickname Pocahontas. Nevertheless, she was victorious and won the Senate seat by a comfortable margin. She used her new tenure to challenge everyone, from banking regulators and treasury officials to members of Wall Street and Congress. I'm really concerned that too big to fail has become too big for trial. We need tough new laws to hold corporate executives personally accountable. No one should be above the law. She called for Wells Fargo CEO John Stump to resign for fraud, introduced the Bank on Student Loans Fairness Act, and reintroduced the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act. In 2016, after staying silent during the Democratic primary battle, Warren finally endorsed Hillary Clinton and had some harsh words for candidate Trump. Donald Trump is a loud, nasty, thin-skinned fraud who has never risked anything for anyone. And that is just one of the many reasons he will never be president of the United States. But she was wrong. Forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. Warren wasted no time resisting Trump's agenda. Have you ever managed or overseen a trillion dollar loan program? I have not. How about a billion dollar loan program? I have not. Okay. In the Donald Trump era, Elizabeth Warren has been playing defense and trying to prevent Donald Trump and his cabinet appointees from rolling back protections that she helped enact. Warren actually found herself rebuked by Mitch McConnell for reading a letter by Coretta Scott King about Jeff Sessions' record on racism during his confirmation. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. 
that moment became something that's on T-shirts, bumper stickers, slogans, and that really galvanized a lot of support for her. It's been very hard for Republicans to get much of anything done this year, and that's at least in part to this resistance movement that Elizabeth Warren has helped champion. We are here to fight back. Enough of Elizabeth Warren. Like you, millions of dollars are being funneled to defeat Warren in the midterm elections in 2018. But it's the rumors of a 2020 presidential bid that has further prompted powerful donors to fund her opposition, often using the same playbook of constant and ruthless ad campaigns that many believe helped Trump win in 2016. It's anyone's guess if she will endure what Hillary could not. You know, the question for Elizabeth Warren is whether she can go from being a liberal firebrand to somebody who can regularly get 60 votes for initiatives in the Senate and 218 in the House and drive an agenda, and whether she can bring together coalitions for political victories. That's the challenge, and uh, we'll see what happens.
Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, has made some powerful opponents. He doesn't know me, never met me, doesn't know what I'm all about. I think they're very rude statements uh, and frankly, tell him I will remember those statements. My message to Donald Trump and his team is that, you know, your views of Islam are ignorant. He's the first Muslim mayor of a major Western capital and proud of it. This is how Sadiq Khan went from the son of Pakistani immigrants to a lawyer, lawmaker, and now the mayor of London. Khan's parents emigrated from Pakistan. His father was a bus driver, his mother a stay-at-home seamstress. The ten-strong Khan family squeezed into a three-bedroom flat in South London. He wanted to be a dentist, but TV in the 1980s convinced him otherwise. Objection! L.A. law with its swagger and ill-fitting suits caught Khan's eye. He graduated in 1991 with a degree in law from North London University and joined a human rights firm. Khan worked a number of high-profile cases, often clashing with London's Metropolitan Police Force. But he had bigger political ambitions. This is what being a new MP is like, squatting on a bench in the absence of an office, dealing with letters from constituents. Reports are just coming in of an explosion here in London. And there's just explosions, and then it just smoke everywhere. Everyone's just asking what's happened, what's happened. Only two months after Khan entered the Commons as a member of Parliament, London was attacked by Islamist extremists. That day will stay with me for the rest of my life. He spoke out against the attacks both as a London MP and as a Muslim. He has been very clear about his opposition to violence, opposition to terrorism, and has set out to make the case for a more, a more open and peaceful Islam. That's Thomas Penny, one of Bloomberg's Westminster correspondents. Here is a man who is a Muslim, and he is standing up and being open and straightforward and being clear that the problem here is not Islam, but it's Islamic extremism. In 2015, a decade after the attacks, Khan ran for mayor of London, and his faith was back in the headlines. His opponent, Zach Goldsmith, trying to link Khan to radical Islam. The debate got again personal and nasty. The Goldsmith camp has called Khan extreme and accused him of associating with, quote, those who seek to do our police and capital harm. It's a pattern of behaviour. Even the former Prime Minister David Cameron repeated the allegations. He shared a platform with Sajil Shaheed, the man who trained the ringleader of the 7-7 attacks and accused the United States of bringing 9-11 on themselves. But the smears didn't stick. Zach Goldsmith ran a very negative campaign that was based on what people knew was a lie. This election was not without controversy. And I'm so proud that London has today chosen hope over fear and unity over division. After taking the mayor's office with a comfortable majority, Khan has brought a business-like efficiency to the role, scrapping expensive vanity projects like the Garden Bridge and the new Routemaster buses which cost £350,000 each. The former lawyer who used to fight the police in court is now praised for his close relationship with them. I was talking to a very senior police officer in the Metropolitan Police who said there was a sea change when he went into City Hall and the police were saying how much they welcomed this because they knew where they stood and he was more straightforward to work with. So he works like a lawyer, he works like a government minister. Khan's kept his faith at the fore. He's an outspoken voice for moderate Muslims across the world. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Now, by giving the impression that Islam and the West are incompatible, you're playing into the hands of the extremists. The ongoing spat between Khan and U.S. President Donald Trump escalated when Trump went after Khan misquoting him on Twitter just hours after the terrorist attacks of June 3rd, 2017. Khan's now one of the most prominent Labour politicians in the UK. In fact, a recent poll of Londoners found Khan was more trusted to keep the country safe from terrorism than the Prime Minister or the Labour leader. 
His story of going from the son of an immigrant bus driver to the mayor of one of the greatest cities in the world plays well with Londoners. But can he appeal to the rest of the nation? Has Khan got his eye on the top job? And is the UK ready for a Muslim prime minister? What does it take to change the world? A big army? A cure to a pandemic? A revolution? All of these take either a lot of people, thousands of hours, or massive amounts of space. But for Julian Assange, all he needs is one room, an internet connection, and the world will listen. Assange is located here, and more specifically, right here. And from that location, He's posted government secrets, classified documents, and leaked emails from some of the world's most powerful people. And in doing so, has been labeled a hero, a villain, a nihilist, and everything in between. This is how an Australian programmer sequestered in the Ecuadorian embassy in London became one of the most influential and notorious people in the world. Born in 1971 in Townsville, Australia, Assange has always been on the move. Living in over 30 homes by the time he was in his mid-teens, Assange, along with his mother and half-brother, finally settled down in Melbourne. His introduction to hacking started at 16 when he was given a Commodore 64, which he attached to a modem. He attended the University of Melbourne, where he studied programming, physics, and mathematics. He never graduated, but that doesn't mean he didn't get an education. By 1991, Assange hacked into the Pentagon, U.S. Navy, and other branches of the U.S. government. In 1996, he was caught by the Australian Federal Police and charged with over 30 counts of hacking and computer-related crimes. He didn't get any jail time, but he was fined $2,100. I think the first taste of what would come later was the hacking that he did as a young programmer, and that really sort of foreshadowed a healthy skepticism of the use and abuse of technology by governments. 
That's Vernon Silver. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg's investigations team. Assange's youth as a hacker laid the foundation for him to start WikiLeaks in 2006. But what is WikiLeaks? It's a website that posts unfiltered, usually classified documents. What separates it from every other media outlet is that they have no editorial hierarchy. With a publication like the New York Times, information comes in, they take that information, package it, then disseminate it for the public to see. WikiLeaks, however, cuts out the middleman. WikiLeaks gathers information, most of it given to them anonymously. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010, then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid, graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats could face real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country, including the United States, must be able to have candid conversations about the people and nations with whom they deal. Shortly after Cablegate, the Swedish government issued an arrest warrant for Assange on allegations of rape and molestation. He claimed the allegations were fabricated to get him extradited to the United States, a claim the U.S. government denied. Either way, Assange's next move was to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, which really was the beginning of the new chapter in his life and what we're dealing with now, which is him being stuck in London. What was supposed to be an office in an embassy is now Assange's self-imposed prison to this very day. But that doesn't mean he's slowed down. Since being trapped in the embassy, WikiLeaks has released files about Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Syrian political figures, and the draft to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then came the 2016 U.S. election. Thousands of leaked emails showed Democratic Party officials possibly plotting against Bernie Sanders in his race against Hillary Clinton. Over the course of 68 days, WikiLeaks released 20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not a state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks and still releasing documents. In March 2017, he started publishing documents from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence called Vault 7. The CIA, the agency charged with finding and keeping our top secrets, can't keep its own secrets. As long as Assange has a connection to the world, no government secret will be too far from exposure. Julian Assange is still in the embassy. Maybe he'll leave, maybe he won't. Kind of regardless, his work has been done. He's changed the way people think about their governments, about their own secrets, about their own hackability, and really the world has changed because of him.
it debuted, the 4G wireless we have today allowed people for the first time to hit the road and explore unknown places with only a smartphone for directions. When 5G arrives, it could enable driverless cars to take us there as well. 5G stands for 5th Generation Mobile Networks or Wireless Systems. It's insanely fast and can accommodate a lot more connected devices. But the reason it's being called revolutionary is because 5G will allow connected devices to speak to each other as well as people. Right now we're living in a world where really it's, it's a one-way experience. That's Bloomberg tech reporter Ian King. The network talks to your phone, you look at your phone and access data, then you send something back to the network. What we're being told about 5G is that really for the first time we're going to see machines communicating with each other over mobile networks in a meaningful way. 5G could end up being 100 times faster than what we have now, with speeds that could reach 20 gigabits per second. In plain English, that means downloading a full-length HD movie in seconds. 5G will also increase total bandwidth, which we will need in order to accommodate the growing Internet of Things. We're talking about the class of devices like internet-connected refrigerators, thermostats, dog collars, but 5G will enable many, many more. Things like your utility, network, factories, where machines are just sat there, not connected at all. Suddenly we're, they're all going to be connected, suddenly we're going to be able to have real-time monitoring. Other things like cars, like uh, utility poles, like your light, you know, the, the light poles. But perhaps the biggest advance will be a huge reduction in communication lag time, known as latency. A network of driverless cars will need the speed of 5G to ping each other multiple times per second to avoid collisions. Near instantaneous data transfers could allow doctors to perform surgery remotely with a robotic scalpel. So how will all this work? First, you need to improve network density. And that's just a fancy word for saying you put more towers out there. What we're being told is that's not actually the case with 5G. The idea is 5G will not only use the existing mobile spectrum, but also tap into higher frequencies called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can carry more data, but only travel short distances. This may mean you'll see a lot more of these base stations around town. And the new towers may have as many as 100 antenna ports, compared to about a dozen on 4G cell towers. So when will we get 5G? Getting 5G ready is expected to cost providers $275 billion over seven years in the U.S. alone. Look for the first 5G service to pop up in big cities sometime in 2019. think of Vladimir Putin, they think of capital P, power. And that's exactly the impression he creates. Whether it's physical power, firing different weapons, riding in various James Bond-esque modes of transportation, or tossing hapless opponents in judo. Or political power, ruling his own country with an iron fist, crushing his political opposition, or, most recently, being accused of meddling in foreign elections for his own benefit. This is how Vladimir Putin went from a poor, tough kid in Leningrad to a KGB spy to the very symbol of modern Russia. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born in 1952 in Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. His father was a factory foreman and his mother a homemaker. It is widely said that Putin's public-facing tough guy persona can be traced back to him getting into fights when he was younger, which paved the way for him to take up judo. After getting a law degree from Leningrad State University, Putin joined the KGB Foreign Intelligence Service. He spent 16 years in the KGB. 
When Putin returned to Russia, he began his political career. He went to work for Anatoly uh, Sobchak, who was then the uh, mayor of St. Petersburg. That's Leonid Bershinsky. I'm a columnist of Bloomberg View. Putin thrived in Sobchak's administration because... He was sort of considered pretty efficient city official at that time. He was very loyal to Sobchak. So loyal and efficient that... He was noticed by Yeltsin's close circle. And those people soon brought Putin over to Moscow to work in Yeltsin's administration, where he quickly climbed the political ladder. Then, of course, he was promoted to prime minister of Russia. That's Dmitry Trenin. I am currently director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Around this time, Yeltsin and the people around him, the so-called family, decided that Putin would become Yeltsin's successor. And then this happened. The apartment bombings were carried out in three Russian cities, killing 293 people and injuring more than 1,000. Putin immediately accused Chechen separatists for the bombings and followed it up with action. He was credited with having a very successful military campaign against the terrorists. And it worked. After that, he became an heir apparent in the eyes of the Russian people. Three months later, Yeltsin resigned. And on his way out, a famous exchange. He was getting into the car in the Kremlin, and the last words that he addressed to Putin before getting into his car was, take good care of Russia. So Putin took over as president, and three months after that, won his first election. But just because Putin won the presidency, that didn't mean he had all the power. This is Michael McFaul. I was U.S. ambassador from 2012 to 2014. In the 1990s, there was a fire sale of all the things worth owning in Russia, and certain people the oligarchs did better than others in that fire sale sometimes called privatization and those people tended to be well connected with the yeltsin regime and they weren't putin's friends but they probably miscalculated thinking that they could easily find a way to influence him it became impossible almost from the start from that very moment there was warfare and the oligarchs that's when putin gave the oligarchs a choice Putin's way. Some of those people from the 90s managed to figure out a new way of, of dealing with Putin and have survived. Or prison. Others could not find common vision, and so they lost their assets. Kurtikovsky once was Russia's richest person worth $15 billion, but he ran afoul of President Vladimir Putin and spent a decade in prison. With domestic power consolidated, Putin focused on restoring Russia's global influence. Putin is the guy who believes in the expansionist Russian state. Georgia and Ukraine and all the other Soviet republics were split off when the Soviet Union fell apart. He still believes that their traditional Russian satellites, a lot of his strategy is about keeping them in the orbit. But he also line, take good care of Russia. That's how he understands it. And he used annexation and invasion, as well as oil, gas, and trade to keep former Soviet republics in Russia's orbit. In 2008, Putin's two terms were up, and he decided to step down as president. Dmitry Medvedev stepped in as president, and Putin went back to prime minister. But really... Putin never left power. He pretty much continued running the country, and Medvedev was a bit of a figurehead. There was actually a period of cooperation between Russia and the U.S. that benefited both countries during Medvedev's presidency. Because Medvedev did not have the same negative attitude towards the West as Putin did. But when Putin came back to run for a third term? In the lead-up to the 2012 election, it is widely believed that both the presidential and parliamentary elections were rigged, and Russians took to the streets. Putin blamed the protests squarely on America, and more specifically, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He believes that she had sent, and this is his words, a signal to demonstrators. Still, Putin won by a huge margin and set about crushing the protest movement immediately upon his return to the Kremlin. Over the next few years, Russia's economy tumbled. Putin annexed Crimea, leading to sanctions. The price of oil fell drastically. The ruble hit a new low. And America played down Russia's influence, with Obama calling Russia a regional power. Despite all of that, Putin's approval rating remained sky high. And then an opportunity for payback. I think I'd get along very well with Vladimir Putin. In 2016, there was one candidate who called Vladimir Putin very smart. Trump exhibited tolerance towards Putin's actions annexing Crimea and similar views on NATO and sanctions. Secretary Clinton didn't support any of those views. 
Even though Putin denies any wrongdoing, the U.S. elections. Yes. The U.S. has accused Russia of being behind the leaking of 20,000 Democratic National Committee emails, which many say helped Trump beat Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. Which leaves us here with the possibility of a President Putin until 2024, positioning Russia to be the world power he always imagined it should be. You've seen a lot of central banks. You know, some central banks, the smaller ones, are raising rates. Um, you know, Brazil, Turkey, uh, Russia as well. Uh, and then, and then other ones are either signaling that they're going to raise rates or signaling possibly that they're going to stop uh, buying, um, uh, buying, uh, so continue, uh, stop, stop their QE programs. Um, but you know, the, that's obviously uh, you know the, the Fed, for example, you know next year or the year after, they're talking about tapering. You know, the ECB also very, very far out. So I mean, yeah. These are all. These, we're looking to see who's going to go first and when this is actually going to happen. But I mean, this is a very, very long-term kind of forecast. James, we're just talking about the fact that PPI is out this week, but we have been seeing these signs, I guess, of more stabilisation. Tell us about what's happening and the, the latest situation with China's economy. The, the Bloomberg Economics is forecasting that China's PPI will peak this month. So, you know, I think their forecast is for about 10% uh, rise compared to what it was last year. And then it should taper off. I mean, the government here is definitely trying to keep a lid on those prices. They're, you know, the NDRC, which is the economic planner, an official from there, said that they're going to work to make sure the coal prices fall uh, going forward. And they've been trying to keep a lid on all the other, you know, commodity prices that have been really boosting uh, the factory gate prices. So, you know, if the government is successful in doing that, uh, they may well, you know, keep either prices from rising further or actually force them to fall. But, you know, one of the things that is driving those rising prices is just how well China's economy is doing and how well other economies are doing, you know, global demand for Chinese goods, but also demand in China for, for, for industrial goods is really one of those things that's driving, uh, those, those in, in, uh, driving that inflation. And uh, without, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a bad thing to be uh, unhappy about, you know, the, the economy is doing so well that it's driving out prices. Um, yeah, China's economy is definitely definitely doing much better. We're on, I guess, at the moment we're on track for the best growth we've seen in a decade. So uh, uh, overall, it looks, um, you know, there are a lot of issues, but I mean, overall, it looks to be doing okay. James, good stuff. Uh, China economy manager James Mega in Beijing. Let's bring in our first guest, Macquarie Group FX strategist Tsang Tu Li. Uh, Tsang, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Give us a sense of uh, how you are interpreting all this and who goes first, what are the implications in this part of the world uh, for, let's say, U.S. taper or indeed anything else taking place with uh, regards to regional effects? Hi, thanks for having me on the show. I mean, it's certainly a very exciting time. Um, we did have the surprise when it comes to, you know, the earlier signal from the Fed that, you know, policy normalization debate um, is, has now officially begun. Um, and I think, you know, with respect to the dollar, it does mean that going into the second half of this year, the dollar will be more supported. And we do expect U.S. yields to rise steadily uh, as we approach the end of the year after, you know, the recent uh, positioning adjustment that caused a bit of volatility there. Um, however, when it comes to Asia central banks, I think what is quite interesting in this cycle is that we tend to think of Asia central bank as, you know, following the Fed. Um, but I do expect most Asia central banks will actually normalize ahead of the Fed in this cycle. Uh, after all, we don't have a new, you know, mandate for inflation targeting. Um, and Asia central banks will have significant constraints if they want to follow the Fed approach because we simply lack the Fed credentials when it comes to you know, managing inflation and inflation expectation. Um, so I do expect, you know, to see the more traditional central bank reaction functions when it comes to inflation. That is, we're likely to see them moving ahead of inflation um, to be preemptive. Um, and with that, you know, I think more central banks will move ahead of the Fed. Um, we do expect the BOK and the MAS to lead this year, potentially in the fourth quarter. Um, but most Asia central banks should follow um, in 2022 as vaccination rates pick up as well. Um, now, BOT, the Bank right. of Thailand, is put... Yes, sure. 
No, no, I just want to just get to say, I've got to just break some news. It's just uh, that we've got uh, the Hong Kong Exchange to resume its afternoon session at 1.30 p.m. It's because we've lowered the rainstorm warning. It was black. It is now red. So uh, we will have a session unless, of course, they reinstate a black uh, 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 rainstorm warning in the next few minutes or hour or thereabouts. Now, trying... The, the, the narrative tends to be that if the Fed starts to raise rates, it's, it's actually quite negative for Asian currencies. But not all of them are the same, and not all of them can be treated the same. So give us a sense of mm -hmm. which ones you'd be looking at to depreciate and the ones which you would perhaps find to be stable. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the part that um, we need to be careful for for this cycle is that, you know, even though the Fed is on the move when it comes to, you know, debating about policy normalizations, as I said earlier, some of the Asia central banks may move ahead of the Fed, and that could give, you know, a various degree of support to Asia currency. So, for example, we do expect the Sing dollar to do relatively well, uh, outperforming the rest of Asia as we move towards the October MAS meeting. I do expect the Sing near to rise to was the top end of its policy band uh, from about slightly above mid at the current point. Um, other Asia surplus currencies we also like um, relative to the more rate sensitive effects like INR or IDR. Now, having said that, um, I don't think the Korean won will benefit as much from the earlier BOK hawkish shift uh, because, you know, with Korean won, uh, the sensitivity of FX to front end interest rate differential is not high. Um, and if you look at mm. the, the way that dollar Korea has traded through this year, you know, even though it's a cyclical currency, it should have benefited from the cyclical recovery. It actually, price action has been skewed very much to dollar Korea top side, whereas, you know, dollar RMB and dollar Taiwan have touched, you know, multi. Year lows. And I think, you know, um, yeah. a, a key missing part of the puzzle here the market um, may not consider yet is because of the structural shift in allocations by Korea pension funds and asset managers towards foreign assets. Um, and unlike Taiwan, yeah. they are doing so on an FX unhedged basis, so that will be more negative for the Korean world. Trang, I want to ask you as well about the RMB, and particularly as we have been seeing efforts from the PBOC in the lead up to the 100th anniversary of the CCP this week. You could expect a little bit of volatility, but this is all about stabilisation as well. And finally, I mm -hmm. guess we are seeing authorities follow up their words with actions too. Yeah, I mean, um, this is the, the historical tendency. We we typically see Chinese regulators managing um, overall asset prices volatility, not just FX, um, but also broader China asset prices into major political events. And I do expect the same to play out this time. I mean, they, they the PBOC has stepped away from direct spot market intervention, but we can still see the signal from, for example, the slightly stronger than anticipated fix in the past week or so. Um, I expect them to continue like that. And if um, there's a chance that we touch closer towards a 650, um, we may see some dollar offer from the state banks as well. But once we move beyond this week, I do think that, you know, the PBOC uh, will revert back to, you know, fixing largely in line with the market and allow RMB to track the broader dollar trend. So you were talking about some of the upside that you're seeing, and I know uh, Sing Dollar was one of your favourites here. What mm -hmm. kind of sort of concerns do you have, though, about the fact that vaccination rollouts in Asia have been patchy? Singapore is probably ahead of the game, but what it means mm -hmm. in terms of the overall recovery as we see Asia still deal with the fallout of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, some of the ASEAN countries are quite lagging when it comes to vaccination. So in the second half of this year, the risk is that we will still face, you know, repeated lockdown and renew outbreak. Um, and that would delay the economic recovery as well as delay, you know, foreign investor engagement in Asia assets. Now, having said that, for FX is not entirely be a bad thing because we have seen that currency, uh, domestic currency actually strengthen going into lockdown. We have seen that in a um, Philippine peso, Malaysia ringgit, and India rupee this year, um, because you know the weak domestic demand is capping import recovery. So for Asia, it may actually mean that we get a more subdued picture for FX, despite the fact that the Fed is tapering. Um, but once we get into mm -hmm. next year, I do expect the traditional, you know, FX um, correlations to growth to return.
Trang, we thank you so much. Trang Tui Le from Macquarie Group joining us here on uh, Bloomberg Markets Asia. We do want to take you back to live pictures from Hong Kong. We've been watching this weather event, the black rainstorm coming through in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong will hold its afternoon trading session at 1.30pm, so that's starting 30 minutes later than normal. This after the morning session was cancelled due to black rain. Uh, we saw Hong Kong's market close higher on Friday, up by 1.4%. We've certainly been seeing uh, a lot of movement coming through in small cap stocks in China. The Chinex we've been looking at having that six-year high. The CSI 300 is only up by about uh, a tenth of 1%. So Hong Kong at this stage looking like it will hold its afternoon trading session just coming up back online 30 minutes later than when it normally would. Let's head to New York now and get the first word news with Bonnie Quinn. Bonnie. Jules, thank you. President Joe Biden's infrastructure deal is back on track after he clarified comments that threatened to derail the bipartisan agreement. Republican senators who signed on to the deal were alarmed that Biden seemed to be making a veto threat by linking the $579 million infrastructure plan to a larger tax and spending bill. However, they say negotiations can move ahead now that he clarified his remarks. Finance says services on its website will not see a direct impact from its ban in the UK. British regulators have issued a consumer warning against finance markets, saying it's one of several crypto asset firms which couldn't meet anti-money laundering standards. The exchange says it hasn't yet launched its UK business, which was a separate legal entity, and doesn't offer services on its main website. Australia has extended virus restrictions as it fights its latest wave of infections. Greater Sydney's 5 million people were put into lockdown on Saturday, while the Northern Territory, Queensland and Western Australia have also imposed new curbs. While case numbers are relatively low, the flare-up puts more pressure on the Morrison government to step up a vaccination program that has lagged many other developed nations. India has redirected at least 50,000 extra troops to its border with China. It's an historic shift towards an offensive military posture against its neighbour. Tensions between the two nations escalated last year with several border skirmishes leading to deaths both sides of the border. Bloomberg has been told that India now has roughly 200,000 troops focused on the border, an increase of more than 40% from last year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Bonnie Quinn. This is Bloomberg. Rish. All right. Well, still to come this hour, the United Kingdom taking one of the most significant moves to crack down on cryptos, restricting Binance from doing business in the country. We're going to discuss the impact on the industry. That's next. Plus, a new bad bank is coming to take on India's mountain of bad debt. We'll discuss the challenges in reducing one of the world's worst bad loan piles. This is Bloomberg. Friday with 30 minutes dedicated to fixed income. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Global market.
Institute's Never Sleep. So stay connected with Francine Lacroix in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kaylee Lines in New York. Perspective on the day ahead. Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in focus after the latest regulatory hit. The UK banning crypto exchange Binance from operating there, although the company says it hasn't yet launched its UK business and services on its website and won't see a direct impact. Let's get a cross asset team editor, Joanna Ostinger. Uh, Joanna, th this is just the latest in this sort of barrage of crackdowns on, on this uh, asset class. Right. We've had all the restrictions from China in terms of mining and trading. Even the U.S. has been looking into Binance on a number of fronts. And the U.K. is clearly looking into this asset class. And um, they've, they've restricted what the Binance markets operation, which is kind of a U.K. registered agency can do or registered company can do. Joe, we've been looking at the move higher in Bitcoin today, and I guess that's that kind of bullish thought that if there's more regulation, then it's possibly uh, good news for the crypto industry. How are you reading it? Yeah, well, that is very possible because when you have more regulation, people might feel more comfortable getting in institutions and even retail investors. So that could be helping things. And um, you also have a, a little bit of a bid from potentially um, post options expiration on Friday. So there are a number of things, including um, Ricardo Salinas saying that he might try to accept crypto in his bank in Mexico. So there are a number of things that are helping the mood as we get going in the week. Jana. Okay, I mean, you, you talk to people who are holders of Bitcoin, they normally tend to be evangelical about it, but what about the more neutral observer? What are they saying about the, uh, the price of Bitcoin now? Yeah, it, there are some questions about it. And for instance, JP Morgan came out with a report on Friday saying that they're still seeing a lot of issues, including they're seeing sales now for to recoup losses as opposed to taking profits. And they actually still see fair value of Bitcoin around $23,000 right now. So there are some questions about where it is, and people still see the 30000 level of key because momentum has been downward lately. So there are definitely some concerns about the Bitcoin price, even though it's seen this rally this morning. All right, Bloomberg's Joanna Ossinger with us in Singapore. Coming up next, it is time for our morning calls, a look at some of the top analyst recommendations across markets. We are seeing Singapore Straits Times Index trade higher by about four tenths of 1% uh, in the early session. More ahead, this is Bloomberg.
valuations, particularly, you know, sort of the technology landscape, have gotten to some pretty extraordinary uh, levels. Uh, so I think it's, it's not a surprise. I don't think it's any indication of the beginning of the end, but I do think markets don't like uncertainty. a surprise, uh, to say the least, that those two got linked. And I'm glad they've now been delinked, and it's very clear that we can move forward with a bipartisan bill that's broadly popular, not just among members of Congress, but the American people. I do trust the president, and uh, and he made very clear in the much larger statement that came out uh, over the weekend, uh, carefully crafted and thought through piece by piece, uh, that uh, that if the infrastructure bill reaches his desk uh, and it comes alone, he will sign it. At the same time, I recognize that he and his Democrat colleagues want more than that. Recognize that he and his Democrat no, colleagues I think that want more than the, that. The important point here is to focus on the statement yesterday where the president's words speak for uh, themselves. I don't. Uh, I speak for the president, but I don't put words in his mouth. And where he has a clear statement, uh, I let that do the speaking. But the important thing is to focus on how historic this infrastructure bill is. Well, just some of the voices we heard over the weekend on President Biden's $579 billion infrastructure deal. That's uh, uh, what we are looking at for the time being. It's been grabbing all the headlines. Uh, there we go. Jules. It has indeed. Let's get a quick check now of the latest business flash headlines, Rish. And sources say Chinese authorities have asked state-owned Citic Group to examine the finances of Huarong Asset Management. Citic is said to have sent a team to Huarong's offices to pour over its books, although it's unclear what, if anything, could result from Citic's involvement. Bloomberg has been told Huarong could reveal its 2020 financial results in the next few weeks after missing a March deadline. Singapore-listed developer Capital Land will divest partial stakes in six of its Raffle City developments in China. The company will be selling the stakes to Ping An Life Insurance and it expects net proceeds of almost $1.5 billion. The deal should be completed in the third quarter. Last week, Capital Land obtained private equity fund manager status in China. Well, sources say UBS will permanently allow as many as two-thirds of its employees to adopt a hybrid model of working from home and the office. CEO Ralph Hummers is said to be leading the charge in a bid to be more competitive in recruitment compared with US banks. UBS will also consider working arrangements based on roles and locations. No date for a return to the office has been set. All right, let's have a look at uh, some more headlines just coming through from Hong Kong. We had a black rain warning, which meant that there was going to be no trading this morning, which has been lowered to red. That means that Hong Kong will start uh, its trading day on the Hong Kong Exchange at 1.30 p.m. More news, though, because uh, vaccinations are now going to also uh, continue. They're going to be resumed anyway after that rainstorm warning was lowered. Okay, let's uh, find out uh, what's going on morning calls-wise. Sophie Cameroon is here with us, and uh, Thai stocks on the way down. We've got the BART also a bit weaker. We've got virus curbs. Bangkok's gone into lockdown for a month or thereabouts. This is not exactly what you might call good news. <laughs> what's been the reaction overall, I suppose? Well, over at City, they have a segment reaction with equity strategists uh, still uh, seeing that they prefer to buy recovery plays on the dip in Thai stocks, noting that the curbs are more localized. So they're looking through the anticipated 10 to 15% dent to earnings in 2021, with the bank maintaining their target for the SET at 1600 In terms of sector preference, city is overweight energy, consumer healthcare, and consumer finance in Thailand. Also, strategists expecting that fiscal stimulus and further handouts in Thailand will provide some relief, Jules. And about 35 minutes away from Malaysia reporting May trade data. So if the ringgit edging higher ahead of that, what is the read overall on the currency? Well, Jules, uh, Pragash Sakpal over at ING says any optimism on the ringgit looks to be an unfounded blip with the COVID situation weighing on the Malaysian economy, noting that the only solace then is uh, higher oil prices, which will boost energy exports. Now, over at Fitch Solutions, they're sticking to their forecast for the ringgit to average 415 this year, noting that the short-term outlook uh, for the currency has weakened significantly with the next level support around 420 against the greenback. But in the long run, over 6 to 24 months, we do have Fitch saying the ringgit could benefit from dollar weakness and the likelihood of tightening in Malaysia. So they see the ringgit averaging 410 next year, guys. All right.
Let's uh, find out what's going on with uh, Chinese stocks uh, on the mainland, at least as uh, they're heading towards their lunch break and having a look at uh, China Tourism, one company at the moment, are making ways right now. It's, uh, reports have been confirmed that it will be filing an application for a Hong Kong listing as early this week. Uh, we've got all that up to 4%. Ping An Insurance, Capital Land uh, divesting partial stakes in a group of companies, including uh, Ping An. Uh, Shanghai Biological, it's going to have a profit uh, between 210 and 240 million uh, 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 yuan. It had posted a loss. So this is better news as a profit uh, alert, as it were, and uh, by an international airport there on the way down after a downgrade coming through at HSBC. And just briefly looking at these coal stocks, there we go, all on the way down as the government's top planning agency told state media that prices will decline next month as production and imports rise. They're off to lunch in Shanghai, Shenzhen. This is Bloomberg. enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Looking ahead to key stories investors are watching in India today, the economy is showing more signs of cooling in May, but the weakness is already beginning to dissipate as virus lockdowns end. The RBI rejected all bids for the benchmark 10-year bond at the weekly auction in an effort to keep yields under check. And on the earnings front, we have Hindustan Aeronautics, National Aluminum and Wellspun Corp reporting today, checking India uh, futures up by about four-tenths of one percent, suggesting that we will see some momentum coming through in the session, which is pretty mixed across the rest of Asia. Rish. Yeah, Jules, and uh, we've got this so-called bad bank in India expected to launch this month. Now, it's designed to help reduce one of the world's worst debt piles, but a lot of people out there say that there's a long road ahead here. Let's find out how long that road is, if you will. Uh, Asia Credit reporter Rahul uh, Sateja joins us now. Rahul, what do we know about this bad bank? As far as I've been trying to find, I can't find a name for it, at least. We do have the name for the company, uh, for this entity. It's going to be National Asset Reconstruction Company. But but it's interesting, you know, there are very few details that we officially know. So there are hardly anything we know right now. And that's what making this launch very exciting. Um, here's some of the things we do know, though. Uh, so the launch is going to be in the coming days. And uh, after seeing what happened recently with China's bad bank war on, India is planning to keep a very tight leash on this bad bank. It's going to have a debt equity ratio of one is to one. Um, one another key detail that we do know from people familiar with the matter is that it, there's going to be a, some sort of a sovereign guarantee as security for five years that gives it some time to resolve these bad loans. Rahul, what does this new bad bank mean, though, to the overall banking industry? How significant is this latest development? 
Yeah, so, so we're talking about really big numbers here. So we're looking at about $27 billion of bad loans being transferred to this bad bank over time, according to multiple reports. And that's about a quarter of India's bad loan piles. Now, what we need to remember is that India has been struggling with one of the worst bad loan ratios for years now. And so this comes as a, as a way for, for the government and for the banking industry to finally kick these uh, bad loans away from the bank's balance sheet. And one of the CEOs of banks I spoke to said that this is going to relieve a lot of the time that banks have been spending on stress loans, and they can finally focus on credit growth, which is one of the key factors to, to, to get India's economy going again after the pandemic. Well, tell us about some of the details, I suppose, that the markets will be closely watching out for uh, in terms of what the bad bank does, in terms of what type of bad loans it takes on, I guess. Yes. So the expectation of the market participants and from the banking sources that I have is that it's going to be the worst of the worst loans. So essentially the loans that banks could not resolve for years now are going to be transferred to this. So there's going to be an uphill task for this new bad bank to resolve these assets. What market is closely watching out for is what exactly is the intent of the government with of the government with this bad bank, and so what uh, I got to know from my source in PwC that uh, it, he was worried that this could be essentially used as a warehousing tool. Which what that means is we could transfer some of the balance from the bank's balance sheet to these to this new entity without really resolving this asset. So, so this is some of the concerns that market has. And how, how market is going to judge that is going to be looking at how many turnaround experts is this bad bank really hiring. Um, another key detail uh, I'll end with is on uh, resolution timeline. India has struggled with its bankruptcy laws that were introduced in 2016, and uh, we are seeing delays in, in resolution. About 80% of the recoveries are more, more than 80 days, uh, more than 270 days. So, so there are serious concerns about uh, these details. The market will be closely uh, looking at uh, what, what government has to say on this. All right, Asia Credit Reporter Rahul Satija with us in Mumbai. Let's head to New York now and get the first word news with Bonnie Quinn. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, Jules, thank you. The U.S. has launched airstrikes against Iranian-backed groups in Syria and Iraq. The Department of Defense says the strikes were aimed at facilities used by militias that launched drone attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq. The Pentagon says President Biden ordered the strikes to warn against further attacks on the U.S. military. Australia's earnings from energy and mining exports may hit another record in the next 12 months, driven by an accelerating global recovery from the pandemic. Government forecasts see resource sector earnings rising nearly 8% to 254 billion US dollars in the 2022 financial year. Rising sales of LNG and coal are expected to drive most of the increase, with iron ore expected to ease from record levels. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has banned alcohol, outlawed public gatherings and closed schools to curb surging coronavirus infections. The country has moved to alert level four, the nation's second highest level, and the restrictions will remain for 14 days. The move threatens South Africa's recovery from its worst contraction in a century last year when gross domestic product shrank 7%. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has moved to re-establish his government's authority after the Health Secretary resigned for breaking his own pandemic rules. Matt Hancock quit last Saturday after he was caught embracing a senior aide in his office in breach of the social distancing guidelines he helped create. Johnson had initially fought to keep Hancock in his job. I understand the enormous sacrifices that everybody in this country has made, that you have made. And those of us who make these rules have got to stick by them, and that's why I've got to resign. I want to thank people for their incredible sacrifices and what they've done. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Bonnie Quinn. This is Bloomberg. Jules. Bonnie, we are seeing Asian stocks hovering near a four-month high. What has been an interesting day here because we've got Hong Kong out of action for the morning session due to that black rainstorm, but Hong Kong will come back online at 1.30 p.m. local, so half an hour later than normal after the lunch break. The Nikkei and the Kospi a little weaker. We're seeing some gains coming through in the Taiex thanks to those uh, chip maker gains. And Australia's market off by about a tenth of 1% as we see this effect of the Sydney lockdown and a lockdown in Darwin too. Let's flip the board and have a look at how that's affecting travel stocks. 
Qantas has fallen the most in a year today, now down by almost 4%. Flight Centre in Sydney also under pressure. We've been watching 7 and I rise to its highest in more than five years in Tokyo. This after the US FTC voted to approve a consent order on its acquisition of Speedway from Marathon Petroleum. And then also watching this big rise that you've seen coming through in a lot of the Taiwanese shipping companies as investors assess rather the bulk outlook, uh, the bull run for bulk shipping expected to last for at least five years, according to the Taipei-based economic daily news. Rish. Yeah, having a look at the oil market as well now, Jules, and having a look at uh, how it closed out last week with a fifth weekly gain. In fact, what we do have is a 52% gain in the oil price since the start of the year. Uh, maybe just under a little bit of pressure today, but that certainly doesn't take the shine off the recovery it's had. Let's have a look at this upcoming meeting of uh, OPEC+. Plus. We've got Energy and Commodities Editor Andrew James joining us now. Uh, and it gives us a sense of how much supply OPEC+, Plus is likely to restore in August uh, uh, at this meeting. I think it's on Thursday, isn't it? And, uh, doesn't Tehran also throw a spanner in the works in all this? Yeah, hi, Rish. Um, yeah, that's right. The meeting is on Thursday. Um, the general expectation is, yes, OPEC Plus will return supply, but um, people are thinking it won't be nearly enough to keep pace with the uh, recovery and demand that we've seen. So according to a Bloomberg survey, They'll restore 550,000 barrels a day in August, and that's only a quarter, uh, around a quarter of um, OPEC Plus's forecast for the supply deficit in August. Um, yeah, and Iran is sort of throwing a spanner in the works. Those negotiations um, over the nuclear deal have been dragging on for quite a while now, and we also have just seen these US strikes over the weekend, which you wouldn't think you're going to help those negotiations. Um, but that said, there's still the possibility that at some point over the next few months, quite a lot of Iranian oil comes back. So that may um, cause the OPEC plus and the Saudis to be more cautious um, about returning more supply. Andrew, is there much of a chance that the Saudis are going to surprise the market again? Yeah, well, well, one thing we have seen with Prince Abul, Abdul Aziz, the Saudi um, energy minister, and that he seems to genuinely enjoy um, surprising the market. Um, and he's sort of said that he sets out to wrong foot speculators. That said, um, yeah, there's always a chance for surprise. But that said, I think uh, there's sort of too many reasons why that, that looks pretty unlikely. I mean, we've also got the Delta variant, which is sort of wreaking havoc in, in, in countries, including like Indonesia. And I think there's potential, even in the more advanced markets for Delta, to perhaps slow the demand recovery a bit. So OPEC Plus will be wary of that. And I also think they they don't really want to threaten the rally. Um, we have WG, WGI at about 74 now, and that's sort of replenishing the coffers of a lot of OPEC Plus members that suffered a lot last year. Good stuff, Andrew. Andrew James, the Energy and Commodities Editor. Let's get to some uh, news at a moment. This is uh, China at the moment, uh, the ministry there, to review anti-dumping measures on European Union and UK fasteners. Fasteners, of course, used in various uh, uh, manufacturing processes, including aircraft there. Uh, also against this background of uh, China suing Australia of anti-dumping measures on some Chinese goods, and that, of course, ratcheted up tensions between those two countries, but it does seem as though we have uh, these uh, anti-dumping measures going to be reviewed by Beijing on uh, the European in uni, U, UK uh, fasteners. So just looking for more on that. When we get it, we'll bring it to you. Juliet. All right, coming up, we're going to speak to Vidit Atre, CEO and co-founder of India's largest social commerce company, Misho, about how it's enabled more than 15 million individual entrepreneurs to start their own online businesses. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Indian social commerce platform Misho recently un achieved unicorn status after raising $300 million in a SoftBank-led funding round. Now it has big plans to expand. Misho wants to help 100 million small businesses gain a presence online. Joining us for an exclusive interview is its co-founder and CEO, Vidit Atre. He's also one of the speakers at this week's Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst event, celebrating innovators at the cutting edge of technology and policy. Vidit, great to have you with us. So as uh, we've been saying, your plan really here was to try and empower entrepreneurs and specifically a focus on females as well. How are you going with that? And I guess, how are you fending off competition from the behemoths as well? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Rish and Juliet, for giving me this opportunity to come and talk about Misho on this platform. So I think the reason why we started Misho about six years ago was very, very simple. So India is primarily a small business economy. Um, all estimates point somewhere between 85 to 90 percent of the entire retail GDP in India to be very small business led. But what has happened in e-commerce in India is mostly branded products in categories such as electronics, white goods, smartphones, branded fashion has moved online. Most of small businesses so far in India were left offline. And that's why like Sanjeev and I uh, started Misho six years ago with a single goal of bringing all small businesses in India online and make them successful. And that's why even the name hmm. of Misho comes up, which means like my shop put together, right? Because we wanted to give a, give a shop of their own to each and every small business in India, irrespective of what categories they are in. Now, like Sen five years forward, yeah, Vida, yes. I was just wanting to ask about in terms of uh, your capitalization as well here, because Bain and Co and Sequoia say that you could balloon from one and a half to two billion today to nearly seventy billion by twenty thirty. That's less than ten years. Are you thinking that is feasible, and and how do you achieve that? Yeah, and I think we totally believe that is possible. Like if you ask us in our team, we believe that's the lower end of the range. And the reason is exactly the same that I was talking about. Like 90% of India's retail GDP is small business led. Even 10 years forward, majority of India's retail GDP is going to be small business led. So with our platform, we are able to bring these small businesses online very easily by giving them a platform that they find very easy to use that gives them the kind of tool that really works for them. So if you ask us, we really believe that is very, very much possible. Uh Vinod, I want to get a sense, actually, of, you know, how it works. You know, you call yourself essentially a, a social commerce platform. You're an aggregator in some ways, I, I, I'm guessing here as well. But you know, what's your unique selling point? Yeah, I think we built the entire platform on a very single but powerful insight. So most small businesses in India are community businesses. So they operate in a particular community. They build trust with that community and they continue to sell products to them. What we said was where have communities moved online, they have moved to social platforms such as WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram in India. So we said how can we power communities on these social platforms to become shops so we enable these offline small businesses to now become like online native small businesses and that's what we build the platform on. So today any small business can come to Misho, start a store, a community store, on some of these social platforms and we give them all tools starting with like logistics, payments, marketing tools and anything else that they need to power the shop. Vidit, 
Give me a sense, though, of the exit strategy. Is there an IPO in prospect very, very quickly? Yeah, so our goal, at least for the next couple of years, is very focused, which is to keep expanding the market, keep getting millions and millions of more of these small businesses come to a platform and become successful. I don't think we are looking at IPO or anything else for the next couple of years at least. But yeah, I think at some point in time, we'll definitely look at some of these things. Did it, of course, the pandemic has taken a terrible toll uh, societally there in India. How has it affected your business? And what has it done in terms of getting people to set up shops on Misho? And, uh, you know, what does that mean looking ahead as well? Yeah, I think the pandemic has created very, very strong tailwinds for e-commerce across the globe. Like you look at any geography, you would have seen e-commerce companies growing very well. But in India, I think those tailwinds are even stronger because pre-pandemic, most of small towns and cities that tend to buy from small businesses more were almost all offline, like, like negligible penetration online. And suddenly the pandemic came and people found it much more uncomfortable going offline and buying products because they wanted to stay safe. And we saw like adoption among consumers, these sellers, manufacturers to kind of move online at a very rapid pace. And we have so seen those benefits even in our business, right? So we have grown like 10x over the last 15 months in mm. terms of number of orders per day, in terms of small businesses on the platform and so on. So very, very strong tailwinds. Vida, just very quickly, sort of plans for a, a greater super app and entering other areas like online grocery businesses. Have you got those plans? Yeah, so I think from the earliest days, we were very clear that we want to go out and enable all kinds of small businesses to come online on our platform and become successful. We never said A category or B category or C category, right? And the kind of customer we serve, 65% of their entire wallet spend goes into categories such as groceries. So it is very, very important for us to get like, small businesses who are in the grocery sector, give them the right tools and technology to come online. And it is one of the big, big focus areas for the company for the next 18 months. Did it, Atria, thank you so much for joining us. There's Amishu, co-founder and chief executive. Now, don't miss the uh, Bloomberg New Economy Capitalist virtual events. Uh, it kicks off June the 30th, just on Wednesday. And those registration details are right there on your screens. You better be quick to take them down. Right, quickly looking at uh, the open there in India. It's just about three and a half minutes away, and uh, we are on an upswing currently. Nifty, Sensex, uh, there we go, up above 53,000 for the Sensex once again. And, uh, of course, are these records uh, that we're managing to attain for global equities. And uh, there we go, Nifty, 102 tenths of 1% up. Looking at also Dr. Reddy's laboratories there as well. And uh, looking also at uh, what's been going on in trying to find the origins of where the pandemic came from, Juliet. Indeed. Coming up, the only foreign scientist to do research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology is speaking out about the possibility that the lab could have been the source of COVID-19. We'll hear her big take next, and this is Bloomberg.
BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Back with Bloomberg Markets, virologist Danielle Anderson was the last and only foreign scientist at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And, uh, of course, this place has become a flashpoint in the search for the origin of the worst pandemic in a century. She spoke to Bloomberg about her time there, saying there's no indication it was responsible for the COVID-19 outbreak in any way. There was no chatter of anything. Um, scientists are gossipy um, and excited, so... Yeah, nothing strange from my point of view going on at that point that, that would make you think, oh, something's going on here. Let's get more from healthcare reporter Michelle Cortez, who wrote Bloomberg's Scoop story. Michelle, what a fascinating uh, story and interview you've had here with Danielle. Tell us more of what she said, because I guess essentially she was saying that uh, there wasn't anything too untoward that she saw. Well, the Wuhan Institute of Virology has become, as you say, a flashpoint. It's a geopolitical issue, contention between China, the World Health Organization, the U.S., and others. And Danielle Anderson says that what she's been seeing in the media and the claims about what's happened there just don't really measure up with what she experienced when she was on the ground. She says that they did, they had very strict and vigorous rules around making sure that they're very careful with the virus that they're using, that they have um, all kinds of disinfectants and protocols. There's a very choreographed method that you have to go through in order to get in and out of the lab. And she does not believe that there is any chance that that virus was man-made and intentionally leaked. While she does say it's possible that it could have come out of the lab as other viruses have escaped previous labs, she does not think that this is anything other than an, a natural origin virus. Michelle, of course, uh, there'll be calls for more investigations into the origins of this. And, uh, and actually, of course, the first theory was it was animal to human contact or indeed uh, eating of an animal. Well, there are viruses that jump from animals to humans all the time. It happens with a, a shocking degree of regularity in the animal kingdom. And, and we all know about that. The thing is, is that we all can acknowledge is that we have no idea where this coronavirus came from. It is most likely that it came from animals. That's what most scientists believe. But the bottom line is, is that we don't know where. We don't know what animal it came from. We don't know if there's another animal that it came through. And the answers to those questions are really important, not only so that we know what happened to us, but so that we can make sure that something similar doesn't happen in the future. Danielle Anderson and most other scientists are saying, we really do need to get to the bottom of this. And we don't need to do it by leveling accusations at, at, at other places. What we really need is transparency and cooperation in a in a global manner in order to get to the bottom of this mystery. Uh, and Michelle, is that likely more than a year on from the pandemic? How what are we actually going to see to get us any closer to answers here? Well, it did take over a decade to find out what what caused SARS, the original coronavirus outbreak that happened in 2002 and killed over 700 people, mainly in Asia. So it is possible that we're going to be getting it, that we can get an answer here and that it might take an, an awfully long period of time. But there is just so much geopolitical infighting happening here. There's so many allegations and distrust in all, in all frankness that we're going to have to get over in order to get an answer. Now, the World Health Organization is saying that they feel like there should be another book at this and other people are getting on board. So hopefully we can get some some openness and cooperation with the intent of getting an answer and not just casting blame. 
All right, Bloomberg Healthcare reporter Michelle Cortez. Let's take a quick look at the latest business flash headlines now. And Bloomberg has learned that Chinese ride hailing giant Didi is planning to stop taking investor orders for its US IPO a day earlier than planned. Our sources say orders will close at 5 p.m. Monday across regions. Pricing is scheduled for Tuesday after the US market close. Didi is hoping to raise $4 billion at a valuation of around $67 billion, well below the most bullish hopes for a $100 billion valuation. Tesla will make a software fix to more than 285,000 cars in China to address a safety issue identified by the country's regulator. That accounts for most of the vehicles delivered there in recent years. The recall is expected to be done remotely with an online update after regulators said autopilot systems can be activated automatically, potentially leading to crashes from sudden acceleration. China's Envision Group will spend as much as $2.4 billion on a battery plant in northern France to power Renault EVs. The carmaker's new strategy will also see it acquire a stake of about 20% in French startup Verka. President Emmanuel Macron is due to unveil the agreements on Monday. Okay, let's have a look at uh, these uh, benchmark, benchmarks. Of course, uh, we don't have Hong Kong, which would be heading up for its lunch break. That's uh, because we had uh, a black rainstorm earlier, which uh, means that uh, there was no trading. But uh, it's been reduced now to amber, and uh, that does mean that we'll have trading at 1.30. In fact, it was at uh, red, which would mean that as well. Uh, Taipei is uh, one of the few uh, stock markets on the way up as Asian equities drift down. Investors are waiting for fresh signs of any health of the so-called reflation trade. Daybreak Middle East is next. surveillance puts global markets into perspective. We're going to try to fold an economic theory here uh, with what we've got based on data. The focus is going to be on the data, the manufacturing data. How the market responds will be really interesting. Timely conversations. Part of getting out of uh, this hole is big fiscal. Keeping you up to date on trends. When do you take this thing off? So you put it on to take it back off. Wake up with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television.
This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East. Our top stories this morning. U.S. equity futures push higher after the S&P 500's best week since February. As investors prepare for Friday's jobs data, Eric Rosengren says liftoff could come as soon as late 2022. Australian stocks slide on stricter virus curbs. Meanwhile, heavy rains have stopped trade in Hong Kong's morning session. We'll have the latest. China's economy shows signs of a more balanced expansion, so you've got a solid underlying growth that's still on track to be the fastest in a decade. And a record burst of sales in the prices corners of the global property market may be ushering in a post-pandemic era of exuberance in real estate, with Dubai among the front runners. We'll have those details as well. Just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Yusuf Gamedadin in Dubai. We're looking to start off the week then on the upside here in terms of U.S. equity futures to kind of extend and build on where we left off late Friday. So currently called just barely above the flat line here, still uh, building on those record highs. Uh, U.S. 10-year yields, currently we are at 152.58. The short bets on treasuries remain near the highest levels of the past few years. That's even after a sharp pullback following the Fed meeting. That's where the J.P. Morgan client survey is showing. Uh, the Bloomberg dollar index, uh, not much of a move, just a tenth of 1% higher. Uh, speculators dumping a lot of the long positions in euro dollar futures in the week ending June 22, creating their biggest net short since February of 2019, according to the CFTC data. And then Brent crude just uh, marginally under pressure here at $76 a barrel. Uh, we are looking ahead to the OPEC Plus meeting, but also a little bit on the geopolitical side, U.S. forces conducting airstrikes against the Iranian-backed militia groups. Uh, the attacks may make it more difficult to revive a nuclear deal. Now we move to Bitcoin. Uh, the J.P. Morgan team saying that blockchain data suggests that uh, the recent crypto sales were made to cover losses, and there is still likely an overhang. Yes, an overhang of underwater positions which need to be cleared through the market. We're looking at uh, $34,450, a uh, very volatile ride still uh, over that uh, course of the week. Let's check in on how the rest of the markets are holding up. Juliet Sali, she joins us from Singapore. Jules. Hey, Yusuf. Yeah, it's been an interesting session because Hong Kong has been out of action for the morning session due to that black rainstorm. We have heard that Hong Kong will come back for the afternoon session, but it's going to come back online about half an hour later than normal. So it'll come back online at 1.30 p.m. local time, and we are expecting that that could be a volatile and choppy start to the trading session. More broadly, we're seeing Asian stocks drift lower. Investors, of course, awaiting these fresh signs on the health of the reflation trade. We've got China's uh, PMI data in focus this week. The U.S. jobs report and, of course, the 100th anniversary party of the CCP as well. You're mentioning there the weakness in Australia coming off some of the session lows as we see the impact of the lockdown in Greater Sydney and in Darwin too, but Qantas has been down the most in about a year. India off to a good start and the Chinex is one in focus. It has gained more than 2% on track for its highest close since 2015, up 15% this year. But uh, look at where the close is. The last high was at 3,982 points and that was just before the stock bubble burst in June 2015. Yusuf. Well, that's quite a ride, Jules. Thank you for running us through that. Uh, Juliet Sali there. Let's also run you through the first word headlines from around the world and get out to Simone Foxman in Doha. Simone. Good morning, Yusuf. The United States has launched airstrikes against Iranian-backed groups in Syria and Iraq. The Department of Defense says the strikes were aimed at facilities used by militias that launched drone attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq. The Pentagon says President Biden ordered the strikes to warn against further attacks on the U.S. military. India has redirected at least 50,000 extra troops to its border with China in a historic shift towards an offensive military posture against its neighbor. Tensions between the two nations escalated last year with several border skirmishes leading to deaths on both sides. Bloomberg's been told that India now has roughly 200,000 troops focused on the border, an increase of more than 40 percent from last year. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has banned alcohol, outlawed public gatherings, and closed schools to curb surging coronavirus infections. The country has moved to alert level four, the nation's second highest level, and the restrictions will may remain in effect for 14 days. The move threatens South Africa's recovery from its worst contraction in a century last year, when gross domestic product shrank 7%. 
And sources say UBS will permanently allow as many as two-thirds of its employees to adopt a hybrid model of working from home and the office. CEO Ralph Amers is said to be leading the charge in a bid to be more competitive in recruitment compared with U.S. banks. UBS will also consider working arrangements based on roles and locations. No date for a return to the office has been set. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Simone Foxman. This is Bloomberg. Yes, sir. Thanks, Simone. Two-thirds seems like a lot, but uh, I'm not in a position to decide. Let's get back to our top story. Stocks are steady then, near record highs to start the week as anxiety over the Fed's hawkish tilt eases. But investors can add another voice to the 2022 rate hike club. You've got the Boston Fed president, Eric Rosengren. He says a liftoff could come as soon as late next year as the labor market reaches full employment and inflation hits target. We'll get the big June non-farm payrolls report at the end of this week. Meanwhile, COVID continues to loom large with Australian stocks lower amid new virus curbs across the nation. Let's get out to Mark Matthews. He's the managing director and head of Asia Research at Bank Julius Baer. Uh, welcome to the program. Eric Rosengren is going to be a voting member of the FOMC in 2022. He talks about uh, a bit of a hype over inflation. It is going to be transient. Uh, just run me through what you expect in the job state at the end of the week. Well, we expect a steady recovery, of course, and especially when the unemployment benefits go away in September, that's when we expect a really big return to the workforce. So uh, gradual increase, and then I think uh, you're going to see a lot of jobs created into the fourth, qu fourth quarter of the year. If uh, more people are returning to the workforce, you would expect more people spending money, et cetera. We're very much in the camp where it is transitory. And I think we're seeing numerous signs of that now from used car auctions to uh, hog futures to Google searches for property. Um, so, and when I looked at a Bank of America survey, three quarters of their respondents also felt inflation is going to be transitory. So it, the jury's out for now because the numbers are high, but we don't think they will be uh, forever. Uh, Mark, I want to get your take on the Delta variant. Uh, you, you had Mohamed Alarian writing a, an editorial for Bloomberg in the last few hours, and here was a key quote from that piece uh, entitled, Delta adds urgency to nation's COVID response. Though there are recent examples around the world of significant disruption because of new waves of COVID, there is little to suggest as of now that Delta in itself is particularly damaging economically and financially in the advanced world. We're seeing uh, moves in uh, countries like South Africa uh, just moments ago, more restrictions, more lockdowns. Uh, are you concerned or do you think that the world has moved to a place where they can deal a lot better with new strains? I am absolutely concerned. and uh, he hit the nail on the head, uh, couldn't express it any better. So we have a divergence in the recovery where vaccinated nations are in a much better place. And unfortunately, many countries in Asia uh, simply didn't order enough vaccines. I, I don't really understand why, but I think they, the bureaucrats in these countries were perhaps concerned that if the vaccines didn't work, they'd be uh, blamed. Anyway, you have fully vaccinated populations which are in the low single digits in most countries in Asia. And so you mentioned South Africa, but Delta is uh, swirling around in um, Southeast Asia. And so Thailand, uh, five provinces around Bangkok and Bangkok itself, they're back in a, in a kind of a lockdown and Malaysia's extended its lockdown. Now, if you add all these economies up, they're, they're really not very big uh, relative to U.S. GDP. But it does mean that the reopening of the world uh, will be, you know, very kind of, I don't know, messy and all over the place. Certainly we in Asia won't be able to open up uh, the way that they have in the West. Uh, let's get to some of your calls around asset allocation, starting off with the U.S. Treasury yields. Uh, just to kind of set the scene, a, a survey then once again suggesting that uh, a lot of traders and investors are steadfast with their uh, positions around, uh, around higher yields, even as U.S. government debt is on pace for the biggest quarterly gain since the pandemic struck early last year. GTV Go for our clients. 
Uh, this is your JP Morgan client survey, which shows that these short beds on Treasuries remain near the highest levels uh, over the past few years. Uh, which position are you telling clients to take? Well, uh, as I said, we're in the, in the camp where the inflation is transitory. And so uh, if that's the case, then there won't be a tremendous amount of pressure on the Fed or other central banks to raise rates. Now, uh, market rates can just naturally go up themselves as the global economy improves, which I, I, I hope and I think it will. And so we are looking for a 10 year slightly over 2% by uh, the middle of next year. Um, all I would say is that the impact on the market of a move from whatever one and a half to 2% should not be particularly large given that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, 2% isn't a very large return. And, and so therefore people would still be looking for alternatives, including in equities. In terms of what a balanced portfolio should look like at the moment, Mark, have you made any changes? Are you going a little bit, uh, a little bit heavier into equities, uh, maybe differentiating more between uh, value versus growth? Well, um, we are overweight equities. We have been for uh, the 10 years I've been at the bank. And so currently we're 52% in equities and 38% in stocks and then 5% in alternatives uh, and 5% uh, in money markets. So within the equity space, the conversation over quality and growth and value is, of course, uh, very much in vogue now, particularly as rates have uh, gone down and, uh, and the growth has come back to life. But um, we actually don't focus on those distinctions very much. And what I would say is that it is an uncertain environment where the massive dislocation from last year and distortions mean uh, a lot of distortions in data now. So being uh, neutrally exposed to quality and growth and value, it might sound boring, but uh, that's that's the way we are. We think that uh, each one of those has its own attributes, and so we're happy owning all three of them. Mark, hold that thought. Uh, we still have more ground to cover together. That's uh, Mark Matthews. He stays with the program. Some breaking lines hitting the Bloomberg from New Zealand and uh, another country that is taking more steps uh, here they are considering new tools to combat risk. That is from New Zealand's Ardern. And she also says that uh, the government may make a, the QR app use compulsory in high risk areas. Uh, the New Zealand dollar at the moment intraday uh, largely unchanged, but we will keep a very close eye on the story for you. Here is what's coming up next, a bit of a preview. Early indications are pointing to a more balanced performance in June for China as investors spurn blue chip names in favor of small cap growth shares. We'll uh, break that down next. This is Bloomberg.
China's economy is showing signs of more balanced but slowing a recovery. An aggregate index combining eight early indicators shows that the economy had solid underlying growth momentum in June and remains in expansionary territory. Economists still see the economy growing 8.5% this year, even after May's data came in weaker than expected. That would be the fastest annual growth in a decade. We'll get the key Chinese PMI figures later this week. Mark Matthews is the Managing Director and Head of Asia Research at Bank Julius Baer. He's still with the program. Uh, Mark, when you look at these numbers, uh, does that suggest to you any requirement for an adjustment in either fiscal or monetary policy tools? Not really, Yusuf. I think they're comfortable. But what I noticed, I mean, the whole market noticed it. Bloomberg wrote an article on it, was that uh, Thursday and Friday and again this morning, the People's Bank of China have trebled their bond purchases in the open market over what they've been on a daily basis um, since March. So, I mean, trebling sounds like a very big move. It's it's actually not compared to what it was in February and before that. But still, it's notable. And I think it might be a sign that on the margin, they are putting a little more money into the uh, financial market and therefore economy. Um, and we know that one of the major reasons for China's underperformance this year has been the withdrawal of liquidity. So um, I thought that was notable. I don't think they're concerned about their economy, unduly concerned, but it was an interesting tweak. I look at the offshore and onshore yuan, and I begin to ask myself the question, what is needed for the next leg up in terms of a stronger local currency? And the reality is that you've got a divergence. You've got domestic demand that is lagging uh, the recovery in industrial output and supply. Does that recovery need to be fulfilled for the currency to continue its move higher? I don't think it's going to go higher this year. In fact, uh, I think what we're going to see in their PMIs later this week is some softness because the domestic economy really already has recovered uh, it, you know, they exited COVID way before everybody else. And and now a lot of the export demand, which was front loaded, should probably ease off as well. So I, I doubt they um, welcome a stronger renminbi. I think, um, therefore, it's not going to go up. Uh, where does that leave uh, equity strategy in, in Asia, Mark? Uh, I mean, how does that get divided between, say, exposure to China and the rest of Asia? Um, so we look at these markets, you know, tactically and uh, structurally. And if we're looking at them tactically, then um, I think that there are markets that will continue to do better than China on a cyclical recovery, uh, the number one being India. And then if you're looking beyond the tactical and taking, say, a five-year view, then I still feel that the companies that are listed in China, uh, where, I mean, something like 40% of the market is new economy in one way or another, will benefit more from the digitalization of their economy than the more cyclically oriented companies that dominate the other indices in Asia, banks and industrials and materials and that kind of thing. So I hope I don't sound like I'm cheating, but maybe I would say in the short term, in other words, this year, um, India will outperform China, continue to do so, but then on a five-year view, you would be better off owning China. Mark, I like those details around your strategy. Really enjoy our conversations. Mark Matthews, he's the Managing Director and Head of Asia Research at Bank Julius Baer. We've got much more to come on Daybreak Middle East. This is Bloomberg. search on the terminal.
to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can answer phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Countries that entered this crisis with limited fiscal space, with more vulnerabilities, need to be supported for the benefit of the world. The transparency of the debt burden for the poorest countries needs to be increased. There needs to be fuller disclosure. Trading revenue is coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. U.S. forces conducted airstrikes against Iranian-backed militia groups in Iraq and Syria, according to the Defense Department. The Pentagon said that the militias were responsible for drone attacks on U.S. personnel and facilities in Iraq. Simone Foxman is watching the latest developments, and she joins us from Doha. Simone, uh, we just run us through then uh, some, of, some of the key facts that have emerged so far. Yeah, Yusuf, clearly this is a developing story, but those uh, airstrikes apparently targeting two locations in Syria, one in Iraq, these were described as operational and storage facilities, uh, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, blamed for uh, drone attacks uh, on U.S. personnel in Iraq. John Kirby, the U.S. Uh, State Department spokesperson, uh, saying that this is meant to send a message of deterrence, um, but underscoring that uh, the common denominator here was Iranian-backed militias. This comes at a particularly fragile time for talks about a return to the 2015 nuclear deal, even though militias and Iran's um, involvement in the broader region aren't really the subject of those talks. Um, it could um, potentially delay talks that have already dragged on, so we'll look for signs of that. Note that the Iran has not yet renewed a temporary pact with the UN's nuclear monitoring agency. That that's also something uh, that's potentially fraught this week. And, of course, we are watching how Iran's new president, who takes office, Ebrahim Naisi, uh, in August, will respond to these airstrikes. And then to the markets, uh, because you got Qatar Petroleum, that the company is in the debt market and what could be one of the largest corporate bond sales this year. What exactly is coming on offer? Yeah, absolutely. This is hotly watched because um, we've reported that this bond sale could add up to seven to ten billion dollars. Uh, no details yet on the exact uh, overall issuance figure. What we do understand is that uh, on offer are five, ten, and twenty-year dollar bonds. Also, a thirty-year uh, Formosa bond, uh, if market conditions uh, are favorable, that could be on offer as well. Um, we've reported th that these bonds. Bond sales would go to sort of the massive gas expansion uh, that Qatar Petroleum wants to undertake, a 50 percent capacity expansion by 2027. And I think what investors are going to be listening to as well, um, not just the low yields that you see in this GTV chart for our clients, um, but also um, Ali al Khwari telling me last week at the Qatar Economic Forum that the country does not need to issue more debt this year, it would only do so op opportunistically. So if you want Qatar paper, this may be your only way to get it, at least in 2021. I'm at the edge of my seat. Uh, we've also gotten bullish calls from <laughs> Morgan Stanley and HSBC on Dubai real estate. Now new data from Knight Frank that could add to that fervor. Uh, but it's a, a very specific part of the market, isn't it? 
Yeah, bond issuance exciting. Also, ultra luxury sales of real estate in Dubai uh, exciting. According to Knight Frank, there were 22 sales of properties in Dubai worth more than $10 million as in just the first uh, few months of this year. That exceeds the total, total number of sales in that category um, for all of 2020. There were 19 last year and adds up to $770 million in the first five months of this year. Uh, Knight Frank says this mirrors the uh, hot ultra luxury market that we're seeing uh, in global cities across the world. Um, London, for example, highest ultra luxury um, uh, rates of sales in the last seven years. Um, and a lot of this, they say, is dependent on Dubai's COVID response. Uh, have opened up, have been a, a beacon for the world and essentially in reopening their economy. Um, but this sort of dependent on that continuing. Again, we've seen more than 2,000 cases reported each day. Um, however, uh, adding to those bullish calls, calls we've heard across the street from the likes of Morgan Stanley, HSBC, on the Dubai real estate market, we'll have to see how that holds up for the rest of this year, Yusuf. Yeah, it's important to remember that uh, we are recovering from a very steep fall in, in Dubai real estate prices. Uh, it all kind of peaked around 2014, 2015. And so we, we've yet to reach uh, some of the levels around, around uh, those particular parts of the market spectrum. Simone, thank you for that. Simone Foxman at the Cato Financial Center in Doha. I want to circle back to some headlines coming through from India, an update on the coronavirus numbers, uh, the government issuing them on a daily basis. So we've got the confirmed number of cases at 30.28 million as of June 28, and the fatalities rise to 396,730 as of June 28. We're also keeping a close eye on South Africa, where the president has banned alcohol, outlawed public gatherings, and closed schools to curb the surge in coronavirus infections. So the country's going to move to level four. That is the nation's second highest from level three, with effect from midnight Sunday. And the restrictions will remain for 14 days. In a televised address from the president, the South African RAND has been remarkably resilient, though, at the moment, still holding at 1416. More to come. This is Bloomberg. world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. It's a really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East. Here are our top stories this morning. U.S. equity futures edge higher after the S&P 500's best week since February. As investors prepare for Friday's jobs data, Eric Rosengren says liftoff could come as soon as late 2022. 
Australian stocks slide on Cirque de Virus curbs. Meanwhile, heavy rains have stopped trade in Hong Kong's morning session. China's economy shows signs of a more balanced expansion with solid underlying growth still on track to be the fastest in a decade. And a record burst of sales in the priciest corners of the global property market may be the ushering in of a post-pandemic era of exuberance in real estate. With Dubai among the front runners, we'll have the details. Let's circle back to the market action and see how the session has evolved. It has been eventful, as always. Juliet Sali has the highlights for us from our Singapore studio, Jules. Yeah, very eventful, including weather patterns and COVID lockdowns today. Yusuf, we are seeing Asian stocks just drift a little lower, particularly with not too much momentum coming through from the U.S. futures market and, of course, questions about the reflation trade. You've got the Nikkei there down by around a tenth of 1%. Australia being impacted by these COVID lockdowns, and you've seen the likes of Qantas hit hard, but it's coming off the lows of the day on the ASX 200 in late trade and South Korea's market pretty flat. Where you're seeing a lot of weakness is actually in Malaysia, tumbling to a seven-month low here. This is after we saw a sell-off uh, across most of Southeast Asian equity markets after Malaysia extended its nationwide lockdown due to elevated COVID infections. And I want to show you as well what we're looking forward to when Hong Kong comes back online, which will be in an hour's time. Normally, Hong Kong would come back on at 1 p.m. local. It's going to come back on at 1.30 p.m. local. This is after the morning trade was scrapped due to uh, what they call black rain. So it was a rainstorm warning that uh, earlier prompted the cancellation of the morning session. Looking like we could see a little bit of a pop coming through in terms of the futures index after we had a pretty good session on Friday, but uh, we are expecting quite a bit of volatility due to the fact that the morning session was scrapped, Yusuf. Uh, we were earlier talking to Mark Matthews, who said that uh, on a structural basis, he was still very much uh, bullish on uh, China, uh, Chinese equities specifically over the course of five years, but tactically it wasn't really going to be his play. Uh, you're looking at tech stocks uh, in the country mm. exactly. What's the story? Yeah, an extraordinary rally coming through in the Chinex index. It was up by about 2% on Friday and another 2% today, far outpacing the gains that we're seeing on the CSI 300. But remember, this is a market that uh, was very hot in 2015 as well. In fact, it was just under 4,000 points in early June 2015 at the peak of the stock bubble. And it's risen some 15% already this year. So, so far, this Chinex has topped this year's closing high, which we saw in February, and certainly outperforming what we've seen on the overall CSI 300. So the economically sensitive value share equivalent down by about 5% over the uh, course of the year. And as I mentioned, we've been seeing the China X up by some 15%. So certainly starting to get a few people nervous out there. Is it going to be a similar scenario of what we saw six years ago? Yusuf. Jules, I love those charts. Thank you for running us through those details. That's Juliet Sali there. Let's get to this part of the world again, because Saudi Aramco company has outlined plans to invest in blue hydrogen as the world shifts away from the dirtier forms of energy. But it says that it will take at least until the end of this decade before a global market for the fuel is developed. Hydrogen is seen as crucial to slowing climate change since uh, the thinking here is, or the theory at least, is that it emits no harmful greenhouse gases when it's burned. I spoke to Aramco's chief technology officer, Ahmed El Khoueta. Blue ammonia, of course, is just uh, basically taking regular ammonia and capturing the CO2 uh, and uh, sequestering that. So uh, the, the challenge for the supply is not really uh, a big challenge in terms of uh, conventional investment for oil and gas. Really, the challenge is the demand. Uh, and so we will see those investments happen when the demand uh, appears uh, for blue ammonia and for other low-carbon hydrogen. Uh, so that's really the challenge. And, and I would say that it's, uh, you know, looking at the markets today and the predictions that we've seen forecast for a blue ammonia, it's going to happen. Uh, the scale up isn't going to happen be, uh, before 2030. We were not going to see large volumes of, of uh, blue ammonia before 2030. And that's based on the projections of both the Hydrogen Council and the International Energy Agency. Uh, there is quite a bit of uh, a lack of clarity around how, you know, how, how, may, how much of an investment is needed to, to get this up to scale, and how big Aramco's ambitions are going to be in this space? So I can give you an idea of investments uh, based on you know what we've seen in the market and uh, what we what we understand of our own business. So for example, you know you've seen the green ammonia project announced in Neom. Neom 
uh, announced a $4 billion uh, renewable project to supply hydrogen. This is public knowledge. Uh, so that's about $4 billion for about a million tons of ammonia, uh, and that's without the electrolyzers and other equipment. So roughly uh, a $4 billion for about a million tons of ammonia, which is equivalent to about uh, 15, 12 to 15,000 barrels a day of oil. So that's the kind of energy we're talking about, investment around this uh, decarbonized energy source that we're calling ammonia or, or hydrogen, green ammonia. Uh, blue ammonia projects are similar to natural gas projects, but with the addition of uh, the uh, carbon capture sequestration part. Uh, and that carbon capture sequestration part ranges, uh, you know, around a billion dollars for every million sure. tons of ammonia. That's a kind of, kind of, so it's about a fifth of the investment of green ammonia, capital-wise. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of high-level numbers, but it gives you a feeling for what's the difference in co capital cost between uh, the blue ammonia projects uh, that we would be looking at uh, and some of the green ammonia projects that are being announced around the world. So there's no clear time frame yet for for those exports in terms of when they could get ramped up and 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 how soon you could get yeah. some traction so, on that, yeah? yeah. So in, initially, you really need to have. Uh, if, this is very similar to the uh, LNG industry. The uh, how the LNG industry works, we believe it's going to work similarly for ammonia. So, you know, the LNG industry really establishes agreements first, offtake agreements, and then makes capital investments. So you're talking about, you know, from the time you get, uh, you know, clear uh, offtake uh, scale and agreements, commercial agreements, you're talking about a five to six year capital cycle to invest in the equipment necessary, or in the in the production and conversion uh, requirements. So you're talking a pretty long time scale, about six, seven years for Bloom, for large scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, blue uh, blue hydrogen, blue ammonia to take off. That's why I said we don't see this happening at scale uh, before 2030. Uh, in terms of what Aramco is doing uh, broadly, uh, so we're seeing uh, energy companies, they're uh, trying to reduce their carbon footprint, and uh, clearly Aramco is experimenting with new ideas. I'm wondering whether uh, solar or wind plants in Saudi or international are on the table at all. Uh, we are evaluating all options to reduce emissions and uh, basically provide sustainable energy. Uh, and so we look at, we are experimenting and we have actually developed a number of renewables projects within uh, our own business. And we are looking at uh, the use of renewables, increasing the use of renewables in our business. Uh, and it'll, But it'll have to be competitive economically and, and uh, uh, renewables uh, are up to a point quite competitive today. Why is Aramco not getting involved with, with green hydrogen and only with blue hydrogen if you are open to all these other ideas? Absolutely. No, we're, we never ruled out any type of hydrogen. We don't even like the term green or blue. We prefer low-carbon <laughs> hydrogen. Um, because really, I, you know, we, uh, to us, it's the economics. And uh, if uh, you know, we can integrate, in fact, we're very excited about it, potential integration of green and blue. You know, we see a lot of synergies in terms of both the transport of hydrogen doesn't really care what the color is and uh, the final use doesn't care either. So we're really excited about integrating, actually. We think we have a huge advantage in the kingdom with the low green, low cost green hydrogen and low cost blue hydrogen. So uh, there's some, some synergies uh, that we are exploring and we have actually some research in those synergies. Quite an eye-opening conversation there with the Chief Technology Officer of Saudi Aramco. Now, as restrictions hamper travel hubs, uh, travel to hubs, including London and Singapore, Dubai is fast becoming a winner in the more than $1 trillion global travel events industry. The Emirate plans to host one of the biggest gas conferences, and you have an African Investor Summit this year, as well as Cricket's T20 World Cup. But while luxury property appears to be flourishing in Dubai, other parts of the Emirates real estate sector are struggling. Let's get to Salah Shama. He's the head of Mina Equities at Franklin Templeton. Uh, Salah, with the news then coming through around property, just giving a, a you know more of a of a bullish case for for exposure to real estate. I'm wondering what you're telling clients this morning. Yes, hi. Good morning, Yusuf. Uh, well, again, I think if you take a look at the latest DLD numbers coming out of Dubai, I mean, June looks like uh, it's going to. Again, is a complete 
continuation of the momentum and the map that we're seeing for real estate uh, in Dubai. I think when you take a look at the residential real estate uh, numbers, you see that you know Amar Development, which probably is the largest uh, uh, largest in, 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 in Dubai, has announced you know record sales year to date. Uh, and again, a testament to Dubai's success in positioning itself as an attractive investment and living destination for global investors. So we see a continuation of the same. We expect Amar Development, which is a proxy on the market to probably clock in uh, uh, or triple its sales in 2021 versus uh, 2020 uh, and to be significantly right. higher than the sales that we've seen in 2019. We saw Mubadala raise uh, about uh, three, 3 billion dirhams from the Aliyah side IPO. Uh, you're saying you're expecting more listings. Uh, where exactly uh, and, and how, how should the investors position around that? Yeah, well, we, we do. It. We, I mean, the IPO pipeline in Mania, we expect it to be quite healthy, uh, specifically in Abu Dhabi. As you mentioned, yes, that now is coming to market. We're expecting two further IPOs to come from Abu Dhabi, mainly driven by uh, Adnoc, so that's a listing probably uh, by the end of the year, Fertig uh, Group, as well as Adnoc with Brimac. We're also expecting further IPOs coming out of Saudi, probably three to four listings, two of them being quite meaningful with SDC and Tadawa coming to market. And lastly, uh, we do expect uh, three to four IPOs coming out of Egypt, but that will be contingent on market uh, dynamics and kind of where, where the market is, market conditions. Uh, in terms of other opportunities for investors, you highlight uh, uh, companies that uh, are heavily involved with uh, urea and uh, DAP, uh, which ones stand out and why? So, I mean, again, we do believe that, you know, 2021, we're seeing a, a year, with quite an exceptional year of synchronized growth. Uh, and as a result, we've seen a significant increase in fertilizer prices. And that's uh, on the back of soaring crop prices, tight supply, as well as increased Chinese demand. Uh, we've seen urea prices and DAP prices increase by more than 50% year to date. And that bodes quite well for MENA uh, fertilizer companies because, you know, as you know, MENA has one of the lowest cost producers and benefits from significantly lower feed stock prices. So in 2021, we expect a uh, significant increase in earnings for companies such as SAFCO, and this is Qatar, Sabic, and Mao, to name a few. Uh, you wrote quite a bit in your research about uh, the Egyptian equity dilemma. And uh, you talk about how there's a need for uh, better and clearer governance and, and for more money and capital to, to, to get deployed. Uh, an underused opportunity, but to what extent could political risk be overshadowing maybe some of uh, those uh, some of those gaps, would you say? Look, the political situation, or at least the political issue with Ethiopia, definitely is a concern. However, we don't think at the moment that that's what's driving the underperformance in the market. Uh, I think, you know, Egypt is caught in what we think is a catch-22, where uh, international investors are uh, attracted to kind of the fundamentals that we're seeing in the Egyptian economy. However, the, the issue that we're facing is the lack of liquidity, uh, the ability to invest at scale in Egypt. So I think that's what that's one of the issues, and I think we're caught in this liquidity cycle that's preventing international capital to come and invest in, in, in the market. And as I mentioned, I mean, if you take a look at the fundamentals and the earning growth that we're seeing in the market, uh, it's quite attractive. The valuations are right now are, you know, at a significant discount to 10-year averages, uh, which is quite reflection, uh, given, as I said, uh, the, 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 the positive growth outlook. Salah, good to see you this morning. Thank you for those highlights. That's uh, Salah Shama. He's the head of MENA Equities at Franklin Templeton. Much more to come. This is Bloomberg.
Let's stay with the region because a group led by the UAE's influential national security advisor has become the nation's most valuable firm after its shares surged 15% yesterday. For more on this, we're now joined by our Middle East markets expert, Farah Al Bahrawi. Farah, so what exactly has come to light then around the company and around its investors? Good morning, Yusuf. Yes, IHC yesterday surged 15%, as you said, after its unit, Alpha Dhabi Holding, uh, had a direct listing on the Abu Dhabi Securities Exchange. Um, IHC's market cap rocketed to 202 billion dirhams. That made it the biggest publicly listed company here in the UAE. Analysts are saying that even because this company has so many cross holdings, that the their value could be even more than that, and it's a bit difficult to even pinpoint what it really is. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the stock has been quadrupling over the, the past year, and not a lot of people can really pinpoint why. It is owned by the uh, UE's the national, or chaired rather, by the UE's national security advisor, as you said. It is an interesting space to watch, and I'm sure you and I will be speaking about it again very soon. Yeah, everybody likes a little bit of mystery, but not if it drags on for too long. Saudi shares, in the meantime, <laughs> climbed for seven weeks amid a wave of government projects. Uh, what are they exactly, and which sectors have been able to benefit off the back of that? Is it sort of your traditional commodity plays, materials? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, construction, sh construction shares particularly have been a beneficiary of a government push uh, in the Saudi business space. You know, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has announced a wave of new government programs such as the Sharia program, which aims to release up to 5 trillion uh, Saudi rials of private investment uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Snitakot program, which is a Saudiization program, and a wave of different uh, construction projects. So we've seen these shares rally, such as cement stocks and steel stocks and even construction link stocks like um, air conditioning um, stocks, they've been rallying as well. So it's an, definitely an interesting space to watch. The index has been up for seven weeks. It started this week off on a strong foot as well and it's trading close to 2008 levels. Um, and who knows where it's going next as more and more government, government projects are announced. Meanwhile, uh, underperforming Egyptian shares are having a, a bit of a break, so they've been rising for five days. Uh, I mean, we talked with Salah Sham uh, from Franklin Temple just moments ago a, a little mm -hmm. bit about the lack of liquidity and sort of the, mm -hmm. the gap mm -hmm. in the market around price discovery. But uh, is there a potential that you're seeing and you're hearing from investors to close that gap compared to other peers in the region? Well, yes, Egyptian stocks have been time and time again this year popping up as one of the worst performance performers globally. Um, that is in part due to, you know, the lack of liquidity in the stock market. Investors do like to focus on the fixed income space in Egypt. This is really attractive, but also there has been some geopolitical tension uh, and the valuations have become really cheap in the market. So some analysts are saying that, um, you know, the market is sort of coming to its senses and um, investors are starting to notice how cheap the valuations are. So this is why we're seeing this strength recently, but also earnings has been a driver as yield reported that it swung to a profit from a loss in the first quarter. So it rallied. There has been a deal, nine billion uh, pound deal with Salat Mustafa Group. That's also helped rally, uh, a rally in the shares. So a few different factors, but it's definitely coming off a really low point compared to really regional and global peers. Yeah, and then there's the elephant in the room with the political risks around tensions with Ethiopia. Credit default swaps uh, as of uh, the last 10 mm -hmm. minutes have mm -hmm. largely remained stable for five-year Egyptian government debt mm -hmm. in terms of insurance. Farah, thank you. Farah Bahrawi, our Middle East mm -hmm. markets and equities reporter. Here's what's up next. The only foreign scientist to undertake research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology is speaking out about her time at the lab and the possibility that it could be the source of COVID-19. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
on here. Let's get a bit more perspective on this from our healthcare reporter, Michelle Cortez. Michelle, should we have another investigation then into uh, the origins of, of the outbreak? Uh, will we ever know where this virus came from? Well, we certainly hope they were going to be able to figure out eventually where this virus came from. Obviously, we don't know now, and the efforts that we've made so far have not been successful. We even scientists like Danielle Anderson are saying that they do believe that we need to get back in there and to look more deeply. The World Health Organization has said that and others are calling for it as well. Of course, the problem is the politics at this point. The Chinese government has been reluctant to just let foreigners come in and basically dig through all their paperwork, especially when there's been accusations that have been unfounded at this point. So really, everybody does need to take a step back and look more broadly for the purposes of transparency to get to the bottom of this and not to be assigning blame, but to be figuring out where it came from. It is important to keep in mind that it took a decade to figure out where SARS originated from. So it can be done, but it might be a long haul. Okay, so what does the scientist tell us about how the lab was run? Uh, she, did she see any signs of an infection? Would she have been able to see infections if the virus was circulating in or came from the lab. So Danielle Anderson has worked in these high security biocontainment labs across the world, you know, in, in Australia, in Singapore, in Europe. So she is very familiar with the technology, with the approaches and the processes that they have in place. And she said the Wuhan Institute of Virology had impeccable reg restrictions and regulations everything she had to do some intensive training in order to be getting into the lab at all and then they had to take repeat tests in order to work independently she said she didn't see anything significant that was going on at the lab but more importantly she did socialize with folks in the laboratory and she was a foreigner she stood out so they did include her they took her to lunches she socialized with them after at dinner and whatnot we know the way that coronavirus spreads and circulates so if it was in the lab if it was spreading among all of these people as they were gathering for lunches and dinners and socializing it's likely that either she or others would have been infected and she was unaware of anyone who did get sick either then when she was in in the lab in November of 2019 or the next month when a lot of those researchers came to Singapore for another conference. So it does not look like certainly it was not right. circulating widely in the lab at the end yeah. of 2019. Michelle, thanks for staying across the story for us. That's our healthcare reporter, Michelle Cortez. I want to circle back to the state of play uh, this Monday morning for you across the world and across asset classes. These are the highlights on the S&P 500 mini futures contract. It's barely called higher here, looking to extend on some of the record highs as of close Friday. In U.S. 10-year yields, we are unchanged, holding on to some of the moves that we had late last week at 152.41. Um, not much movement in the FX complex on a G10 basis, uh, and then Brent crude under pressure. The coverage continues from here, from London, from the rest of the world. This is Bloomberg. Day. It was the first time uh, Indigenous designers um, showcased uh, Australian Fashion Week and it was a full house of all Indigenous talent.
It made me so proud. Absolutely beautifully done. I mean, the designers, the pieces on there. I think just about every model or every second model is like, oh, I want that, I want that. So each of my pieces, I we have our signature prints, which are um, each tell a story and is a, definitely a contemporary um, way of uh, experiencing Aboriginal culture. And then each of my pieces are named after, yeah, inspiring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. So when the customer buys something, they're learning about the story, they're learning about women. I would hope that it isn't tokenistic, and I would hope that it's not done to tick a box. Um, and so, you know, those things have to be, you have to be mindful or, or about that. But, um, yeah, I think it's incredible what's been achieved so far. But, you know, there's always room for growth. <laughs> I think the elevation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these spaces, um, it's, it's long overdue and it's, it's, it's a really powerful and incredible time, I think, and, and to be a part of that is really special. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. everyone from Bloomberg's European headquarters. It's 6 a.m. in the city of London. I'm Danny Berger with Yusuf Gamaluddin beside me in Dubai. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Here are today's top stories. Variant concerns continue to mount from California to Sydney. South Africa raises its alert level. Stocks, though, little change. Treasuries holding losses. The UK joins the crypto crackdown. Regulators ban an affiliate of finance, giving it until Wednesday to comply. Bitcoin trades higher. Plus, another twist in the re return to the office story, UBS splits with Wall Street with two-thirds of staff set to mix working at home and in the office permanently. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Yusuf. So great to start this week beside you. Really a treat here. And when it comes to the market story, it really feels like resiliency is the word. You have concerns of the Delta variant, be it a new lockdown in South Africa, new restrictions, continued restrictions in Sydney, yet we're seeing a market that's just charting higher. We're seeing future positionings on the S&P 500 hit their highest in about a year. It just seems like there's not really a lot of concern there. Maybe we won't see yeah. concern until we get to the end of the week in jobs numbers. I mean, look, I spent all of last week in the Swiss Alps, and as much as I and the people nice. around me had a sense of normalcy, the reality is that we're seeing more and more countries take action to combat mm. the Delta variant. You mentioned South Africa. That really caught my attention for a number of reasons. They're locking down schools, they're banning out alcohol, and they're outlawing public gatherings as well. It's also in the mind of Mohammed Alarian. Here's a key quote that stood out to me. He wrote this piece just a few hours ago. Uh, the recent examples around the world of significant disruptions because of new waves of COVID, with Bangladesh being the weekend's most striking example, there's basically little to suggest as of now that Delta in itself is particularly damaging economically and financially in the advanced mm. world. Yeah, and, and I guess that makes sense why you would just sit on your hands if you're participating in this market. I mean, of course, you have to be worried about the Delta variant spread just as, as a citizen of this world, but does it creep through to the data? Michael, Michael Purves over at Talbacken says that even if there is economic damage, you hide out by buying big tech. I mean, that's not exactly, you know, buying puts or, or, or taking shelter somewhere. Absolutely, and uh, we have, of course, a very, very busy week at ahead in terms of economic data. I want to get through some of the particular asset class indicators, some of the highlights here, just to get you started on your Monday morning on the S&P 500 mini futures. We're looking to extend those record highs, currently barely called above the flat line. On the U.S. 10-year yields, also unchanged. What uh, really stood out was the uh, CFTC commitments of traders report that indicated, again, that on some of the 
uh, long positions in euro dollar futures in the week ending June 22. Uh, that basically uh, saw their biggest net short position since February of 2019. So on the Bloomberg dollar index and on euro dollar currently down a tenth of 1%. Then Brent crude uh, just holding above $76 a barrel. Remember, we're looking ahead to the OPEC plus meeting on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there are still these very real geopolitical tensions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We understand that there have been airstrikes on some Iran-backed militias. And uh, that's going to be a very important one to watch because does it make a nuclear deal less likely? Now, to our top story in more detail. Concerns about the Delta variant are growing across the world. We talked about South Africa. The country has raised its alert level. Sydney, it's gone into a two-week lockdown to fight an outbreak of the variant. And just it raises further questions about the reopening of the economy. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Rachel Chang to kind of drill down into this. Uh, I mean, how is the world then facing the new variant here, Rachel? Hi, yeah, that's right. We are seeing Delta spread very quickly, very aggressively across the world. We do know Delta is the most transmissible variant that has emerged from the pandemic so far. We know that there's evidence that it causes more serious disease, that it causes worse disease as well amongst young people. Um, and it's possibly linked to uh, more unusual symptoms never before seen. So that's a major challenge. But at the same time, the calculation doesn't change. The vaccines are effective against the Delta variant. They do prevent serious illness and death, even if you're infected with the Delta variant, so the challenge remains the same to get those vaccines out. Rachel, thank you so much. The story will definitely stay on top of. Thanks to Bloomberg's Rachel Chang. Let's get more on this, though, with our guest host for this half hour. It's Eleanor, Eleanor Taylor, Joladeen, co-head of Swiss and Global Equity at UPB. Eleanor, first off, thank you so much for joining us. And Yusuf and I were just discussing this resiliency in markets despite concerns about the Delta variant. Do these new surges of the variant change your outlook at all or, or change your positioning, rather, when it comes to global equities. No, it doesn't actually. I mean, for us, it's been very clear that we weren't going to wave a wand and that the um, the, the COVID-19 was going to vanish. Um, we just are going to have to adapt and know how to live with uh, this unpleasant disease and um, distressing disease. The countries that you've mentioned, which are going back into lockdown, first of all, they're countries that are actually hitting winter. Um, if we look at Australia, if we look at South Africa, there are also countries, if we consider South Africa, which which unfortunately have not necessarily had the rollout of vaccine programs that one would have wished for them. And if we look at equity markets and the major equity markets which concern investors, it tends to be in areas where the vaccine rollout has been stronger. And it does look, again, at those vaccine rollouts, if indeed Delta is uh, very infectious, that the vaccines do seem to have some effect upon it. And I think that would explain why equity markets don't seem to be overly concerned about um, Delta at the moment. But in terms of positioning, I think that any sensible investor will be yeah. uh, positioning, bearing in mind that um, that the, this, this disease isn't going to go away. So you're going to have a sure. mix of reopening, yeah. but not a full-blown reopening. Eleanor, but it's not just a developed market problem. As much as uh, a lot of the struggles are in developing nations, uh, the reality is that uh, at some point, uh, this is going to feed across. Uh, we live in an interconnected global economy. Uh, there's, there's nothing that says that it's purely going to be segregated. Is that something that could flow onto the shores of, say, the Fed or the ECB, that they're going to have to take that into consideration as well, that the conditions in societies outside of their primary markets are struggling? Wouldn't it be nice if they did take that into consideration? Um, I think that obviously if the Delta variant or if the pandemic in general continues to be a pandemic for longer than what is currently in people's estimates, then we might see a slower move in terms of tightening uh, monetary conditions coming from some of the central banks. You're absolutely correct. Uh, the world is interconnected, but there are some parts of the world which are more interconnected than other parts of the world. And and I'm afraid uh, that um, those more interconnected ways have found ways of dealing with the pandemic, and we perhaps have not been uh, as concerned as to um, the situation in the areas which are less connected or the parts of society which are less connected. Does that mean that we could see less volatility from here on out uh, then potentially? 
I would say in the short term, we might have quite a bit of volatility as people try to second guess what central banks are likely to do and as people uh, deal with news flow regarding uh, the pandemic, not so much necessarily the Delta variant in areas of the world which are less important in terms of equity markets, but um, certainly uh, in terms of uh, I think the central bank action may preoccupy a little bit more. On the other hand, I think central banks are very aware of the influence they can have on equity market behavior and economic behavior, and that we, I do have the impression at the moment that they are trying to talk very carefully uh, to the market to prepare them for any kind of tightening that they may do. And the tightening, I'd be surprised if it was going to be a full-blown interest rate hike anytime very soon. It's more likely to be uh, using some tapering exercises and so on in the in the short term. So maybe a little bit of volatility yeah. around that, but clearly um, central banks are trying to avoid that happening by clear signaling. Uh, Eleanor, I was talking to Mark Matthews from UBS earlier, and he was saying there is little point to him around the debate of growth versus value. Uh, to him, it is best to just stick with quality, and both of them can be represented at this stage of the recovery in a balanced portfolio. Would you agree or disagree with that? I, I think I was saying to one of your colleagues only a couple of weeks ago that um, factor investing is um, fraught with difficulties and that's not something that I would necessarily choose to do myself. Um, very much in an echo of um, that person's comments, I would say that um, if you think about quality as being um, a signal of a company which is capable of creating value, so it's really investing in their business or through acquisitions in a way which will be value creative, then clearly those are the kind of companies which withstand throughout any kind of economic cycle. One has to remember that a value investing is investing in a company which is desperate for some kind of economic action away from their own activities in order to have a decent performance. I don't find that a particularly attractive way of investing. Uh, so clearly I would prefer those companies which are value creative or uh, as your previous um, commentator was saying, quality would have a quality bias, yes. Eleanor, hold that thought. We still have more ground to cover together. Eleanor Taylor Jalidin, UBP from UBP, stays with us. Uh, now let's get you the first word news with Simone Foxman. Simone. Hi, Yusuf. The U.S. has launched airstrikes against Iranian-backed groups in Syria and Iraq. The Pentagon says the strikes were aimed at facilities used by militias that launched drone attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq and were intended to send a clear deterrent message. The U.K.'s new health sec secretary says his top priority is ending the pandemic and getting the country back to normal. Former Chancellor Sajid Javid was named to the post after meeting.